All right, we are now back in open session, and we're going to have two items t tonight for a recommend with a recommendation for action. The first one is a student disciplinary decision action for student 2020-001. Is there a motion to uphold the January 30th, 2020, February 5th through 7th, 2020, and February 12th through 26th, 2020 suspensions for student 2020-001 and approve the recommendation for expulsion of student 2020-001 as presented. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All right, Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Olczyk. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried to uphold the January 30th, 2020, February 5th through 7th, 2020, February 12th through 26th, 2020, suspensions for student 2020-001, and to approve the recommendation for expulsion of student 2020-001 as presented. Next on the agenda is uh, the personnel report. Is there a motion to approve the personnel report as presented in the packet of materials? Second. Second. Okay, um, Melissa, please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried. The personnel report has been approved as presented in the packet of materials. All right. The big item we're here for tonight, our one discussion item, is going to be the recommendations that came out of uh, the Citizen Task Force. Um, some materials I know provided in advance, but I, I don't know if you want to kick off with uh, Paul with us. Yeah, so at, at this point, I think um, we'll have uh, Dr. Ike Miller uh, get Paul back in here, and uh, or Melissa, I don't know if you know how to do that with James. Oh, perfect, there's James. Perfect timing. Um, so just so the public that is here, uh, we had a citizen task force meeting on Monday, and we're going to be spending the bulk of the time this evening um, going over the recommendations for the citizen task force. The gentleman that you'll see on the screen is Paul Hanley. Uh, Paul Hanley is our consultant from Beyond Your Base who is working through the citizen task force and community engagement process uh, with us. So Paul's in Denver right now. And um, after that... Um, after that, then we will move into a conversation about uh, the Longfellow Center and uh, administrative spaces in uh, District 58. Paul, can you hear us okay? I can hear you. So, Paul, how well, how well were you able to hear everything going on uh, in at the last meeting? I hear you. Uh, I could hear most of it. I uh, I, um, I missed uh, Dr. Russell's intro there. Did he want me to to dive in, or I, I missed it? Sorry. No, Paul, that's okay. What I was uh, sharing uh, is who the person they were seeing on the screen. Um, we do have several okay. members of the, uh, the the public here. Um, I don't know if you can okay. see them because we've got the room split, so we can see the. The screen, but what I said was the primary focus of the conversation tonight is going to be talking about um, the citizen task force meeting that we had on uh, Monday evening, and then potentially the board may take action on um, a community engagement plan or to test any of the things that the task force um, had suggested to the Board of Education. And then after that, Paul, which uh, you do not have to be a part of, then we're going to move into a conversation about the administrative centers in District 58. Oh, great. So in here, what we is just a small slide. So I don't know mm -hmm. if uh, did you want me to go over what the results were? Does he have something? Do you rather if you have what you want to present? So um, why don't we give uh, Paul the floor and yeah. summarize kind of his views on the task force, and then uh, the next steps. Um, what we're referring to the next step slide from the task force meeting is um, should the board want to take action that that is um, the items that we would consider. But Paul, if you want to summarize your thoughts on that task force meeting and, and kick off the discussion sure. with the board, that would be great. And did the board have um, access to Marsha's summary? Yeah, so yes. the board would have received uh, yesterday uh, Marsha's written summary and then also some of the raw uh, data numbers as well. 
Okay, so um, as you know, we met three times with the task force. The first meeting was a big data dump. The second meeting, we uh, presented some proposals um, for their consideration. Um, there were a lot of moving parts, so we felt um, we felt like we needed a third meeting, especially after the board felt like they should, um, the task force should consider some options that were less than the, uh, the big $226 million option that was on the table, as well as the 190 some odd million. And so um, at that third meeting, I unfortunately could not participate, but Marcia Sutter uh, was there to uh, help facilitate. Uh, Dr. Russell did a great job, Derry did a great job. Um, I was glad that Tracy was there to share her thoughts. Um, and so some of the takeaways that I think kind of high level takeaways are the following. Um, one, they felt like boundary adjustments should not be part of the proposal. Doesn't mean that boundary adjustments should never be discussed again, but they felt like it should not be by part of this proposal. Um, they agreed that there should be a special focus on maintenance projects and that that held true at the second meeting, looking at the larger proposal, as well as the third meeting. They totally agreed that the maintenance projects, kind of the meat and potato stuff, needs to be addressed. We can't, you know, they felt like that, that couldn't be set aside. And they also felt like as part of that, the secure vestibules should be lumped in with the kind of uh, priority place on maintenance projects. Uh, the third item, um, they support grade reconfiguration. And so what happened at the first meeting, or at the second meeting rather, is that uh, Amy with White & Company uh, presented <coughs> an approach to grade reconfiguration which involves uh, expanding the middle schools and moving sixth graders into the middle schools. And it was a really comprehensive plan. And then because of the cost of that plan and in an effort to try and reduce the size of the total proposal as well as the tax impact, um, uh, we had asked that uh, White & Company come back with a kind of light version of grade reconfiguration. However, when the task force heard that last time at the last meeting, they understood why that concept was on the table, but they preferred the uh, original approach that was more comprehensive. So then the, the next item, um, the task force was not excited about a proposal that is just kind of maintenance only. They, from what I could hear at the third meeting, and I was I was uh, uh, dialed in remotely, but could hear that, uh, and also with the results that we reviewed, um, that it's they felt like it was a once in a generation ask this opportunity to put something on the ballot. It's not like your school district comes back every five years for a, for a tax increase, and so they felt like it was really important to get it right the first time, and that. Uh, if it was only a maintenance only proposal, I think that some would be disappointed. And then lastly, um, in looking at Marsha's data, they, they did like an exit, um, exit survey where they each individual could rank order various elements of a proposal, possible proposal. And in addition to um, maintenance and secure vestibules, I felt like uh, updating bathrooms as well as addressing air conditioning um, we're kind of second in line, but they've held import, placed importance on those upgrades. And then my just kind of thoughts on the side is, as they were talking at the third meeting, um, I jotted down that, that even if middle schools received a lot of the dollars in terms of improvements, that every child's going to benefit. Uh, every, every elementary school would benefit. Uh, every elementary school child would benefit. Um, I jotted down that a $200 tax impact seems like a lot more reasonable than $317. And then lastly, uh, this point was raised at the meeting and I thought it was well made that District 99 asked for $136.6 million um, and that was just for two schools. You have 13 aging schools, some of which are, are surpassing 90 years old. Um, and you're not asking for athletic turf fields and things like that. This is just kind of absolute highest priority need. So whatever you, whatever number you come up with, 
um, I think that, you know, hopefully the taxpayers realize uh, what's in front of you in terms of number of schools you're trying to take care of. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions or sit back as others kind of discuss this. And if you have questions, I'd, I'd be happy to weigh in. I think everyone had an opportunity to to, uh, to read through the attachments that came out what was it yesterday. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, I, I guess I'll, I'll start. So I, I, I think uh, we're getting more data and we're getting more emotion into this conversation, which I think is great. I think the, the process has kind of got us to the point where we expect it to be. You know, I think when we start throwing out numbers, you know, whether it's 226, 150, 100, 180, whatever it may be, I think it just shows how how complex of a problem we're, we're trying to solve. Um, but I guess I'm still, I was perplexed by your uh, um, synopsis, Paul. I guess I was looking for more um, concrete outputs from that task force than more questions. So I guess, what would you respond to me saying that I, I feel like we're just getting more data thrown at us as opposed to um, concrete conclusions from the task force that kind of propelled us to the next level? Well, I think there are some kind of overarching themes that arose, and one is that, um, as I mentioned, they like the concept of grade reconfiguration. So that's a big decision because if you don't do grade reconfiguration, all of a sudden there's a large cost that drops out. So that, you know, I think that's a that was a big decision recommendation on their part. There was one person out of many who's indicated that they didn't agree with that. And so all, all the others were saying, yes, we, we like the concept of grade reconfiguration. Um, as far as, you know, we presented a variety of new options. We, we had established some guardrails just to try to figure out how can we get them below the original big ask. And so we had just thrown out 150 to approximately $100 million just to see what they would come up with. And we also gave them a variety of options to consider. And they kept going back to kind of this option uh, B, uh, which included grade reconfiguration. It also included all the major maintenance. Uh, it included uh, secure vestibules. Um, they, you know, it's it's tough because when you start, you know, you start seeing things like air conditioning crossed off the list. Um, you know, they still were kind of, you know, moving the direction of this opportunity B, but. You know, it doesn't include air, did not include air conditioning. Um, so, you know, you, it's rare that you have a task force that, that, you know, everybody's set on the exact same plan, uh, especially with so many moving parts that you have in so many schools. So I was, I was proud of their efforts that they're, you know, giving you at least some higher level recommendations with regard to some of the big moving parts. What I will tell you, Steve, is that at my table and the one next to our table, it was it was very it was very definitive on um, <coughs> six to eight reconfiguration. They felt not only was that good educationally, but <coughs> really propelled us where we needed to be for the next twenty years or so. Um, and on top of that, without doing any work at, at the other at any school, even though there's some work, yeah, but even without doing any work, that does alleviate some pressure. Uh, at every building. I think where it got hard was um, there was highlighted sections in there that in every plan it was like stuff you can't take out. We have to do this if we want to maintain these buildings for the next 20 years. And out of the gate that's like $70 million. To do the, raid the grade reconfiguration was $50 million. Right? You know, so once you put those two things together you, you're basically right smack dab in the middle of, of the range that we gave them. And I think where the frustration came was, is while they ranked those, that part is the most important, they were still looking at this other, these other things and going, well, could we just squeeze in the air quality stuff as well? That's another 50. That would bring us to like 172 million. Um, but then you were getting some pushback, but they're, they're going, but then nobody's touching lighting, nobody's touching bathrooms, nobody's touching these kind of things. And then the discussion kind of went back and forth. Well, those are things that are easier to fix later because they're not as much opening the main structure of the building. They're not reshaping the buildings. Those kind of so that is where um, there was not going to be a general consensus uh, at that point. And I think the other hard part is I think that there are some people that would love to get in the weeds 
um, and go, well, can we know exactly what wires are going to go and what walls and that kind of stuff? And that's not where we're at at this point. Where we're at at this point is to get a big picture so that we can test things in the environment. And at some point, we'll go down the line and draw more sophisticated plans for what we do. But th that, those components are expensive, and we can continue to tweak that um, leading up to potentially going out for a referendum and even afterwards, as long as you kind of stay within your, in your same buckets. Like, you'll keep refining that as you get ready to do any work. Um, and I think there are some people that want to know, if we did this exactly, what would this look like, and what would this classroom look like, and, and how would this science lab be impacted, and those, and, and those kind of things. And, um, if, so I, if I could add on to yeah, what you said. There was, in the room, there was probably eight tables, and I would say when we broke into small groups at each table, giving them the guardrails of the 150 and 100 million that from the last time we all met here. Um, when we came back to the big group discussion, I would say there was three or four tables out of the eight that went over the 150 automatically and said, we, it, we, can't, we can't do it and it's too important. We want maintenance, we want secure vestibules, and we want air conditioning and 6-8 middle schools. So then the rest of the tables were like, well, I thought the I thought our assignment was, you know, and so then like, oh well, if that, then I, then we want that, and so <laughs> <laughs> then exactly it like, happened. then it then it like spiraled, and then I was like, I want I want to add this or whatever. So that's where we got to the bigger, the bigger numbers. Um, I had people attack coming up to me afterwards asking why the board they were disappointed that we came back after the 226 and and brought it down and said, look, between these guardrails, and they were they were upset that we had done that and hoped that we would consider... The big number? The bigger... They understand 226, but they were hoping that the numbers that were talked about Monday night would be part of the discussion. I'm going to just uh, jump on to your earlier comments, Steve. Um, given, like, the, the, like the, the lack of a product um, coming out of the task force, I guess my question to, to Paul and to the administration and to the task force members is what, is, what do you want from this conversation exactly? Like what, what, is, what is our, our, our intended outcome for this conversation? So I'll, I'll jump in, you know, obviously being at the task force meeting. Um, and by the way, thank you, everyone, for being here. I, I know we have former board members in the room, so it, it's nice to see and staff and everyone. So thank you for coming, because this is, this is important. We've been talking about this, I mean, quite frankly, since I've been growing up here. And, 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 and there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, I do think, Steve, we did get some concrete things from um, Monday night. Um, my takeaway as a superintendent is there's people wanted, I, I don't think you've got any doubt that years one through eight on, on the required maintenance have to get them. I think everybody gets that and in, in, in that we need roofs, we need parking lots, we need functional plumbing, we need all those things. And, and so I don't think you have any doubt w with that. Um, Security, I also think, is um, an essential part of, of everyone's plan. Grade level configurations, um, Paul put it nicely, there was one person in the room of about 60 that said they didn't want to do the grade level reconfiguration. So I think those are your big three things. I think the issue is most people also wanted air conditioning in all of the schools. But given that that would throw you up into that 170 range, I think that's where people were a little skittish uh, about that um, and that's where we started to get in a conversation of you know this is a once in a lifetime opportunity we should at least test that see where it comes out and all that so I walked away with, with some pretty concrete um, things to your point I, I think what we need coming out of this meeting this evening is to direct Paul and myself and Marsha and the team what do we want the community engagement push to look like um, because we need to now go out to the community and say here are the things that we're considering give us your feedback that's that qualitative data that's where we're running our community engagement sessions and all of that so what should we be going sharing out there with the community and telling them that this is what we're very interested in pursuing as a school district I think the other thing for Paul is on the other side what should we be testing for that quantitative data <coughs> to determine what the task force can review at the June meeting to make a final recommendation to you on whether or not you should be putting a ballot on the, or excuse me, a question on the ballot for this November. So that's what I walked away from uh, Monday night. 
I do feel like, you know, if we started out here in December, we got to here in, in January, I feel like we're here right now. And so I do feel like it's, it's getting better. Um, but this is a very complex thing. You've got 13 aging facilities with a ton of other issues on top of that, and it does make it very tough. But, but that was my takeaway from Monday evening. So, so do you think it's when we kind of get to this level right now, we're saying that 170 number is something that that task force could – I think that's something you're going to have to discuss tonight. I, I, I think we're looking for some some clarity on, you know, is it just a grade level configura configuration and, and, you know, administration, you're going to have to figure out a different plan for air conditioning long term in, in the school district. Or is it no, you know what, go out there and look at it all, knowing that's a pretty big number though, and what the potential tax impact can be. So that's what I think we're looking for. I think there was some really good conversations that the board needs to have tonight around that 150 versus 170. Because everybody wants the required maintenance, everybody wants a secure vestibule, but everybody seemed to want the middle school and the air conditioning too if they could have it. So how much discussion did the tax burden kind of get as part of the overall engagement? It was brought up quite a bit. However, <coughs> the people in that room I think were a lot less concerned about it than than others, you know. Uh, than I think the community at large. Yeah, I think that yeah. that's an important thing for me to bring up. Is we have people in this room that even I think our our most conservative voices were people that were really engaged in what we were doing and have had time to really deep dive into the actual needs. And some of them were even shocked at, at, at some of the condition. They've had an opportunity to tour Herrick and look at the the lab space and look at you know um, and things within those buildings and had a understanding of what we have that. One, most of them, a lot of them in the room have kids in the school, or even if not kids in our school district, kids in a school and understand kind of baseline where we go. And so we got to think about not just the te how they feel about the tax implications, but about the community at large. And so, yeah, they were looking at it and they're going, what dollar per year is it different? And, you know, and but at the same time, we got to look at it and say, what is a number that doesn't have a shocking effect? Uh, on our community members, even if it, even if that shifting number may not be a lot per per year, you know, what can our community at large uh, support? And I, I don't know that this particular group gives us that answer. I think we have to have a bigger, broader conversation. Which is why why Paul, that's when he goes and and goes out to the community right. to 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 float the topics that came out of that were born out of the task force. Exactly. So mm -hmm. today, are we? Are you expecting or wanting us to come up with options to then take to Paul, who can then take them to uh, phone poll or wh however? We're so we're going to say, here's we're going to now take what the task force gave us and discuss, and we're going to come up with option A, B, and C. And then Paul's going to take those to the community in some sort of polling or whatever. The case is that is that the expectation is that we're moving or what? Paul, what do we have to give Paul you? What, what yeah, do you so, need today? So I so ideally, I would like you to come up with what I call your plan A that I mentioned before, that you truly believe voters would support. Uh, and then I'm hoping that you come up with a plan B that is scaled back from that, that we can also test. I spoke with, the, with uh, Jim Hobart today, the pollster that will do the, the uh, uh, phone poll, and he indicated that please don't have them come up with a plan B that's um, $15 million less than plan A. <laughs> it needs to be a... It needs to be a large difference so that so that when we test it, I mean, we may test, you know, a hundred million, and we might still get pushback. So we don't know yet. Uh, but it, it, you can't be, you know, it can't be a few ten, fifteen million the last where they're like, well, that, what's what's the difference? I mean, so I'm hoping tonight that you come up with what you feel is a plan that meets the kids' needs, meets the the school district's needs, uh, it meets the taxpayers' needs uh, altogether. And so I think based on, you know, what we provided to you from the task force, um, I think there's some good leads as to, as to what that might look like. And uh, to give you a gut instinct of what that room was feeling like, and that doesn't have to, that, that just needs to be a starting point for the conversation. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'd say that it, they were saying sort of the, the baseline maintenance stuff, plus six through eight middle schools plus air. The test is option A, and the test is option B, either just dropping the air or dropping the air and then adding in bathrooms is, like, is, is your plan B. Which What was bathrooms around eight grand, right? I mean, eight million? 
Nine point three. Nine point three. Yeah, if you take grand, that's no, that'd be great. Uh, <laughs> Wait, can you, can you stop right there for a second? We're yeah. talking about bathrooms. Yeah. So one hundred ninety, one hundred seventy-two million is the number I've heard that includes bathrooms. Is that correct? No. No. So one hundred. So one eighty-one would include bathrooms. If you wanted yes. bathrooms in there okay. with air conditioning. Got it. Okay. So here's here's my two cents. Um, at the last special meeting we had. Um, I think we, we put those guardrails on there of 100 to 150 million. I think we're pretty um, purposeful about that. Um, I think uh, at least six of us were very were like thinking 150 was our, our, our cap. Um, and I and I believe it, it, since I've been on the board, um, conversations with, with with Dr. Kremerskoli and with Dr. Russell, both administrations and board members, you know, we, we always were pretty close to that 100 million mark. Um, I think the one thing that I'm considering. When I when I think about a uh, 181 million dollar price tag, is um, you know Paul mentioned that we had we have just in the last uh, year or two uh, in our community our taxpayers have all um, had their tax increased by 299. Um, the impact on the 300 thousand dollar home was about 65 dollars, and that's because they had bonds rolling off. Uh, we don't have bonds rolling off, so the, the the financial impact on a family is four times as much. In, in that in that range, in that 170 to 180 million dollar range, um, not to mention um, a number of other tax increases that we've we've all as Illinoisans have all increased, uh, have all experienced or are going to experience in the in the coming years. Gas taxes going up, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, my my critique, and I think uh, Darren, you, met, you mentioned this. My critique of the task force is probably. Uh, we are, don't have a good slice of the community as it, as it pertains to families that are living paycheck to paycheck. Um, so I don't think we're hearing like the, the voice from, from um, households that are on a fixed income. Um, so I'm I'm just I'm very conscious of that. I think that everything in the plan is great. I mean I, I love there's there's no idea I don't support 100% um, in a full throated manner. However, um, I. Just think that we need to be a little bit more um, reasonable in terms of considering the impact on the on the average um, taxpayer. Um, I I think that year year one to eight maintenance is just a non, is non negotiable. I think security we're also hearing pretty loudly there, but I, I still think we need to get this into the um, 130 range as as our option A, and maybe um, something, something smaller for option B. Uh, so, and so what that would be, just to kind of give everyone right. a heads up, that op then option A would be um, the six through eight middle school reconfiguration and the 70 some odd million dollars of baseline stuff would be around 100 and, and, and 30 ish million. And then I don't have the charts in front of me. And then if you pull and that out. security as well. Um, no, that, no. Yeah, the security yeah. stuff was in our baseline highlighted <coughs> stuff that, that was in that. Baseline seventy three million dollars wasn't security was in every option we had right yes mm -hmm. yeah yeah yes. um, so that would include that and then if you pulled away the sixth rate middle school that would drop off fifty two million dollars uh, off of that and there's like the page two I'm it's sorry Greg you're saying op your option A would be maintenance one through eight and, and security. And then on the low end, Correct. opportunity F. And, and no, my option A would, I think, will include 6 8 middle school. Oh, okay. 6 8 middle school, maintenance 1 through 8, and security. And, and if, that's like, that I, if that's like the $130 million range, then yeah, I would support that as yeah. our option A. And then. It's kind of the opportunity C in the lineup. Correct. Uh, I yeah, opportunity C and opportunity F is kind of what you're thinking. Number two most supported uh, option. Can I. I know that the task force was not very interested in uh, six to eight light. How does everyone here feel about six to eight light versus six to eight original? No, why? Because I well because I, in my opinion, the six to eight light uh, is affecting services between the two buildings and off product offerings with the cafeteria and how they do it. And it, to me, it feels like you're just trying to get people in the building mm -hmm. and not yes. thoughtfully think about the administrative center and the support staff being in a centrally located. It isn't thought, it, no offense to the drawings, but it, it's not a thoughtful approach. And I would just rather just not do it at all. It, it didn't seem to me that the, the 
the great the light version of great configuration. You can correct me if I'm wrong. It didn't seem to me like there would be any upgrades to the educational experience in terms of of our middle school is looking like a 21st century classroom. Yeah, there no libraries aren't touched in light, so you can't make it look like STEM and you know make it the 21st century learning like you're saying. It, it would not be reimagined whatsoever. It would just be the same. Okay. Just, like you said, you're just getting kids in the building. You're getting kids in the building. Yeah, okay. basically it's like adding 18 classrooms. That, that's Can I also add that I noticed that in no plan except for original plan 226 million is <laughs> elementary future ready learning addressed at all? What is the, what's so the rationale on that? Well, the rationale is all these different opportunities, just trying to, you know, bring that total number down. The elementary future ready learning, uh, there are going to be things that you're not going to be able to get in these packages. So as we look back as an administrative team, we said, okay, what are some things, obviously, A, we're not going to be able to get in here, but B, we might be either able to save for or budget for. So when you're talking about future ready learning spaces, um, again, you'd have to develop the model for what you would want for those, but I've got experience, you know, my, my previous district, we added those future ready learning spaces. So we added um, smart labs, which are, you know, coding centers and robotics and those types of things. <coughs> they range from two hundred to $400,000 a classroom with the electrical and with everything like that. that. That's an example of that. That's something that we looked at and said, okay, if we have to cross something off the list, and we need to save for, we could certainly do that. We also looked at the need for if you were to remove two sixth grade sections at each building and then put them over at the middle school, what would you immediately use those classrooms for? We would immediately use those classrooms for the addition of an art room because remember at every elementary school you're combining art and music, so we would need two future learning spaces in each one. Um, in most schools, you don't have a place right now for band or orchestra or um, really productive small group instruction. So we felt like we still have time to really discuss that future ready learning space and whether that becomes a part of the libraries or whether that becomes a part of the extra classroom. There's still time for that and that's a cost that we could budget for, albeit our budget is tight. You, you, mm -hmm. That was one. We're going to have a very difficult time budgeting out of our normal budget for groups. We're going to have almost an impossible time budgeting to replace um, the HVAC systems in, in the school, like those types of things, and so that's why that would have come up. Okay. And another thing, and this goes to the same reason why people I don't think resonated with the, the light versions, is there are certain things that you do, if you make a decision <coughs> now, box us in and make it difficult to do later. There are other things that if you don't do now and then you step in later, don't incur additional costs. Like you didn't sure. wall off a section of the building and now you'd have to knock down something you did or, or, or right. reshift something later. Mm -hmm. So stuff like lighting or upgrading bathrooms. Yeah. Uh, labor costs might be more expensive in the future or whatever, but there would be no additional costs that are incurred if we waited. And a lot of the future ready learning had to do with the stuff that we are putting into the room more than the, um, the room itself, though there, there is some, some money sort of for doing some construction level work too. But that could be done at a later date without it sort of impacting, um, without us sort of hindering that by, by choosing not to do it. Is there, Paul, like, are there, what are the ramifications, like, let's say we're, we're listening to the task force and none of the things on here, in my, in my personal opinion, are fluffy or um, over the top. So what would be the harm in testing the 170? I, I had 178. I don't, I, Thank you. What <laughs> would be the harm in testing it to see, mm. say, with question. huge education on the maintenance? I went on the website today. O'Neill's steam boiler, the capacity for a steam boiler is 30 years. It's 63 years old. Uh, the public needs to know what is what the hell is going on in these buildings and say the, the boiler at at Herrick is 68 years old. People's houses are, don't have those things. What I We have evidence to back up every single thing we're asking for. So I don't see what the harm in asking for this. And if it comes back and, and the public says, no, we don't have an appetite for that, then we, we have at least quite... But I don't want to be penny... What was it? Pennywise and pound foolish. I don't want to, like go small when we could try and ask. We're not, it's not on the ballot. We're asking. We're just asking and educating them so that people start knowing what's going on in the buildings, why we need the uh, maintenance, why we want the secure vestibules, why the bathrooms look like they did in 1950. I, 
So that's that would be my opinion. So, um, so the risk is that <coughs> the risk of, is that originally you were at two. 26. 26. And we all we all agree that wow, that's a risk. That's where they, that's where the taxpayer gets into a fetal position and never wants to talk again. Um, but at 178, right? All of a sudden, starts to feel more, at least a little more reasonable. Um, and I can't see everybody, so I don't know who is who's presented so far. But um, somebody mentioned that you have to take into consideration folks who are on a fixed income, and I absolutely absolutely agree. Um, so I don't want to just throw out 178 saying, you know, hey, no big deal. It's a big deal. I understand. Um, well, well, Paul. But, but, at this, but at the same time, you're right. I mean, this, it, you know, as the a lot of the task force members mentioned, this is a once in a generation yes, ask. It is. This is not a school district that comes back every five years with their hands out asking for money. And so um, you've got to dial this thing in right. And I think it would be. It would be disappointing if it was dialed in just way too tight. So I just wanted, um, just going off the the original, the the 100 to 150 with Greg. I mean, my original number, for whatever reason, has always been 180. Um, I had stated before that I think we are underestimating um, what Donners Grove is willing to put into their kids and into their school. Um, and I just believe if we go with the building and we make it safer and we do the roofs and we're not that's where we should be already already <laughs> and we're not making it we're not that doesn't catch us up with the surrounding school districts that it's like education education wise and I mean, if we go with a, a light version and we're not even touching a bathroom or we're not putting in air conditioning, it is 2020. I mean, this is this is when we, at least in the pre-ask, we ask, are you willing to, again, not go on a vacation? And I'm not slighting people who live paycheck to paycheck. I was a single parent for nine years and lived way under and in my parents' basement because I couldn't pay, but going to the school district was very important to me. Um, and I am thankfully in a different uh, financial status right now, but it's still not where we can go on vacation all the time. When things are prioritized and in our storytelling, if we tell it that this is important, you make those, we don't go to Starbucks. I mean, it's not like you're, you don't maybe get something new um, there's going to be different things that everyone is going to have to give up in some ways. Some families, this will be nothing. They won't even think about their taxes because they this is not a, a problem for them. But then on the severe side, there is. But it's important to me as a parent that my child is getting what is entitled to her by living in a town like Downers Grove. And I just feel like we... By having anything 140 or lower is selling ourselves short, and we are not going to be able to get this ask again in the next 20 years. And, and Jill, I appreciate you sharing that perspective. And, and I think where my head's at at this point in time is I think that's the voice that we're kind of getting from the task force that's very pro-education and, and willing to kind of invest. But I think the whole reason why we went to that 100 to 150 guardrails is we don't think that the voting base would, would support that large number, right? Like, I guess... But we don't I, know yet. But I guess, why, why did we make that jump last... Was it last week or two weeks ago to go to the 100 to 150? I'll share why I pushed for that jump. Uh, I think I was one of six of us that pushed for that jump. Um, go, the uh, director from the task force last time of 226 was the idea of you should go test six to eight middle schools. And then the, they felt like they didn't have a lot of time, and they said we sh you should just test the number that we have. They didn't have the time to go through this process that we asked them to do in the task force meeting number three. And so we felt like there wasn't an actual consensus. It was a, the thing that you pitched to me sounds interesting, let's go test it. And that's not, I don't think, I don't think we have more than one opportunity to go to the community. This is a once in generational ask, and we, sh we should get it right. The first time, every one of our engagements, all of our PR, all of our phone polling, whatever we're gonna be doing next, has to tell the same story, has to be a compelling story, has to be a well thought out story, and so I felt like going out with a 226 ask about six eight middle schools and just and everything wasn't well thought out, and so I think that's what we said. Mm. I think we, we give guardrails on the other side of 
100 to 150 to really force the conversation that they exactly had. And what I was hoping to hear from the task force was exactly what they came back to us with, was a level of passion and interest and wanting what things that are on this list are relatively pretty basic for most school districts. And so I, I think they did their job. I think they, And we give them the directive because of the first time we did, weren't satisfied with how much time they had to debate at the level that they did in this task force meeting. So a couple <coughs> of uh, things that I would just jump in in terms of feedback, because, you know, we've tried to get the most representative group we possibly could. That being said, our best <coughs> contacts are always going to be the parents in our school yeah. district. And, yeah. and so, you know, I, I throw that caveat out there. We have, as this task force has evolved, tried to get more and more people who didn't have kids in school or who have traditionally had very conservative views of, uh, of taxes in Downers Grove. Um, from some of those people, um, here are some things that I'm hearing. You know, I know the school district needs money. Um, it's just a matter of how much do you need. Um, one comment made at the task force meeting that I thought was very appropriate. You know, at the beginning of this, when you threw out that number, there was no way I would have supported that. I didn't even know what six, eight middle schools were. I, I, I never went to something like that. Um, I now know how important it is, but it took you three task force meetings to get me there. So how are you going to educate the community in 30 seconds yep. to make sure that they get it? Because otherwise, it doesn't matter how good of an idea you have. So if you're going to go for something like that, we really have to roll up our sleeves and, and think about what is our 30-second stump speech, or stump speech, excuse me, how do we communicate that? The other thing I think that the board always has to keep in, in their head is we may think this is a great idea. Um, I certainly do. As the superintendent, I've read through every page of the strategic plan. That's exactly what the community asked you to, to do, right? Um, as Darren points out, though, until everybody sees the number. You also have to remember that once you put this on the ballot, should you do that, you're out. And you're going to have to have excited people to go and carry this torch forward. And, and so depending on what you put together, if people aren't excited about it, that's not going to happen and, and, and vice versa. So just some, some food for thought. But my experience with, with the people on the task force that wouldn't represent the traditional parents is I think they understand, but I think they needed a lot of education to, to get there. And um, I think that's going to be very true throughout our town. And, and so um, it's, a, it's a big task in front of us no matter what dollar amount you put up there. But the more that dollar amount goes up there, the more education and um, communication we're going to have to do. I know. So I think we all can, like, recognize and understand what, what you're saying, Jill, about, like, why don't we, what's the harm in asking? And I think at, the le at one of the last meetings, we definitely talked about how we were a little apprehensive with, like, scaring people off with that first number, and then they're just like, oh, I'm done, because they're, like, no way. Well, and, they and then they ridiculous. stop listening. Right. So, Paul, is there any, um, like, evidence for you in having done this so many times in terms of asking like for a big ask initially in terms of polling and having that be like soundly rejected and then not having people come back to the table for a smaller number down the road like is there is there yeah, evidence so that I, says uh, you can scare yeah, people away it's a good good question so i worked with lasalle through high school district and they i walked into their um board meeting the first night and they said we're thinking about 98 million dollars and i said what's the tax impact and it was crazy, some big number. And I said, I, I just drove around your town. There's no way people are going to support that number. And they said, well, what, what do we do? I said, well, then you need a plan B. And so they, they came up with a plan B, which was $63 million, I think. And I said, I also need a plan C. And they kind of cringed and said, well, that's like just meat and potato maintenance stuff. And I said, okay, well, how much is that? And they said, that's $35 million. So uh, Jim Hobart put 60 some odd million into the field. Uh, the first night he called me at home late at night and said, this is awful, I mean, this, this is pulling really poorly. And um, so then I called them back and said, I think we're gonna have to test your plan C because your plan B is getting crushed. And uh, so the next two nights, we put plan C into the field. Um, it came back with a support level of 50.5 or 50.1% support. And in the end, we, had, we ended up with 50.1% support <laughs> with $35 million. So we started in the 90s and then got a reality check and got it down. So, yeah, you can, I mean, you can use the science, right, to, to 
you know, to dial this in. We, we had started with that big number when we sent out all the informational materials. And so people knew the number. And they didn't, you know, as we were scared about last time, they didn't come out with pitchforks, but they told us soundly uh, in, the, uh, in the phone call, you know, no way. So I, I think it's a combination of feeling comfortable, at least, that you're not going to create this scary situation with taxpayers and asking way too much, but also not shortchanging yourself to at least use the science to kind of figure out how to dial this in right. Mm -hmm. So are, you know, am I scared with 175? A little bit, but not, you know, you look at the tax impact, yes, it is way bigger than the tax impact for District 99, but that net tax increase for District 99 was, was small, I mean, compared to what what other tax increases there are out there. It's rare that I would ever have $65 tax increase for the you know, $136 million deal. I, I do want to piggyback off something that Greg said, and um, I have had the opportunity to talk to some of my neighbors and people around the area, and I'm, to be frank, a lot of these numbers just are a little scary for them. And I'm not talking about the big number that we're asking for. I'm talking about their the impact that they have on their taxes. I mean, they're, I happen to live around a, a decent amount of people that are retired, and they have homes that have been paid off for 15 years, um, but hold a lot of value. Like, the, the home itself has a lot of value, but they don't, they're not sitting on liquid assets. So you can't just look at, go, oh, well, if people don't have a lot of liquid assets. They probably fall closer to the 250 or 300,000. They may be sitting on a piece of property that's worth $550,000, but they may not really have $410, $420, dollars a year that they can really be contributing to it. I, I am very nervous about the impact this is going to have on people. I, all of this stuff is incredibly important. I sit on that task force, and I, I want to fight for all of these things as well because you're absolutely right. I, I don't remember who said it at the table. Other school districts have these things. Like, we're not asking for anything. Extraordinary. That, right. But at the same time, we didn't, you know, and it, it maybe it was happening, but 20 years ago, some of these questions needed to start bubbling up, and they didn't, and we're here, and this stuff has been compiling on top of each other and top of each other and top of each other. So, um, we might have to go out and test an A, B, and a C. If we want to do a high number, we may, you know, if we want to test a, a 170, we may also need to, to look at, at, at something along the lines where we're getting closer to that $100 million mark. To kind of uh, reference back to the example that, that Paul just used, maybe you're, you're looking at, you know, the, the, the full ask that you were seeing come out of the, the task force, uh, the more, you know, maybe a more reasonable version at the sixth grade middle schools, but lacking the the air purification and, and, and conditioning, or and then one without six to eight middle schools, but cleaning up all of our buildings that we have, doing the minor updates and the maintenance and getting bathrooms done and stuff like that and getting that done and that was at option F or whatever, which is more like 98 million. Um, you might have to do it because, I mean, we haven't heard of the community at large, but I, I have to say that looking at these numbers, I have hesitation in and yeah, pushing I'm forward on that. I'm going to speak about something I don't know a lot about. I'm going to look at Todd to help me out on this <laughs> one. Um, <laughs> paying off bond debt, you, know, you can jump in as soon as I say something stupid. Paying off bond debt is not like your mortgage. It's not linear. It's not necessarily going to be $238 every, every year. It's going, there's going to be some years where it spikes a, a way above that, and then there's going to be some years where it, it, it goes into a valley. I mean, it's not like it, you can rely on exactly 238 years dollars every year, so that is going to impact our fixed income families quite a bit. So, let me answer this way. How we came up with the numbers that you have for estimates uh, in, in increases. Um, we look to keep a steady, rate, a consistent rate that we would borrow um, over a four-year period. So, if, you know, as, as construction goes through, uh, we have a 3.5% uh, EAV growth pattern uh, into that piece um, and kind of our normal new new construction going on. We do have the TIF, the downtown commercial area coming off of the TIF, which will mean a large increase in assessed value uh, that will be taxable that is in, that is in current. Um, 
so we we structured it that way to minimize the tax impact as much as we can. Um, it, it, but but the structure is to keep a consistent rate across that that process um, and to let that EAV growth help pay you know and keep that, that piece so that you know you, you don't have the spikes and so forth. Okay. So I believe that Does that answer what you were looking for? That's that helps allay one concern. Okay. So Emily, one of the questions that we have in the FAC, and this gets to your question earlier, how come some things like future ready learning w w were crossed off? Um, in the Financial Advisory Committee, we're, we're looking to keep that fund balance policy, number one, so you never have to worry about tax anticipation warrants, but number two, how can you build a capital fund that you can actually access to start to do some of these projects? So while not all that TIF money, some of it has to go obviously into the educational fund, but, but some of that TIF money would help build up that balance to then put back into um, some of these projects. That's also, you know, years 9 through 12 in the maintenance bucket, some of those things as well. So that TIF is, is a really big thing, but we have to be careful. I, you know, same thing I tell my kids at home. You can't spend the same 20 bucks six different ways, though. So we have to make sure that we... we outline that in a, in a capital plan that whatever doesn't get called for in this and that would go in there. One of the other things Todd and I have talked a great deal about is um, but this is not something we can rely on but something to just keep in the back of your head. If Springfield does get their act together there could potentially be a capital plan for schools um, where you could offset some of these funds if you were to get them. So you could have a possibility years down the road and again if I school districts you know, don't always get paid by Springfield, but if they did have something, that could be something years later you can go back to the community and abate and give back money should you get any money from the state. Paul, um, <clears throat> I'd love your advice. So where my head is, is uh, I think mainly where Steve's head is around uh, we know some things, we don't know everything. And the next step in my life, my, like, the project plan here seems to be go test to figure out what that gap, to fill in that gap of what we don't know. Um, when you test in a phone poll or when you do community engagement, uh, I still stand by this, we have to have one story and we have to be able to tell it time and time again through each of these engagement opportunities uh, and it has to be 30 seconds or less. When we think about phone polling, we think about community engagement, what do we do like on the storytelling side to be able to like make, like do the PR push here? Like, uh, uh, to educate. Yeah, to the, the education plan that is the compelling story that we are all compelled by. Uh, how do we package that in a way for somebody that doesn't think about D58 every morning? What's the, yeah, how do we put our, our PR story together next? Well, I never say that we sell stuff, right? I wouldn't say that we're selling anything. Um, which is, the, which is the reality. I mean, we, you've been, you have respected these taxpayers throughout this entire process. Um, so far, right? Including doing the citizen task force and doing all the stuff that you did to try to keep dialing this thing in. Um, I already know in advance that I don't even have to pull to tell you what some of the things are that people care about. They care about safety and security. They care about protecting what they already own. You know, uh, Darren was talking about people having homes that they've owned for a long time. Well, those are their assets, right? Their assets are also the schools. And so to protect those is super important. Um, they love things like, you know, replacing boilers and blah, blah, blah. Um, <laughs> will it be um, a challenge to um, <coughs> lay out the benefits of moving sixth graders into uh, uh, with seventh and eighth graders? Kind of, but I mean, there's some pretty basic stuff that happens. One is you're freeing up all this space at the elementary schools, many of which are way at capacity. And so that just makes kind of common sense to the average Joe. Um, and then there's some reasoning that we can go into that's a few more bullet points um, of the benefits to uh, the sixth grade student of now being mixed in with seventh and eighth graders. Um, we're not trying to hit like 50 bullet points. We're gonna hit like three major themes. Um, I think that you should, again, settle on one main project, one main proposal that is, you know, fill in the blank. I don't know what that number is. But then we're going to go test some other things. We'll, we'll actually test parts of that package. And we're going to see if there are any clunkers. Um, and then we're going to test um, arguments for, arguments against. If you'd like, we can split the sample. We could test a, you know, like a, a 178 versus a 151 or something. 
and we split that sample, and then at the end of the poll, have a follow-up question that says, when, for those who are no or undecided, say, if the package was reduced to, uh, you know, $98 million, just focused on, um, on uh, maintenance and security, would you support it? Just see how, see how it all rolls out. Um, so there, there are definitely some strategies with polling that we can use to, again, help provide you with, you know, give you information that you can make an informed decision at the end. Thank you. So is that our next step? Find something in the 180, 170, 180 range and something in the 150 to test? I, I think, I just want to kind of summarize the, the 226 meetings. I feel like I just want to make sure that I walked away with the same conclusion from the last meeting that the 226 would be the the pitchforks and the fetal position response. <laughs> is, that, is that the the same conclusion, Paul? That was my response. I totally agree with that. I was I, that was my fault. I'll throw myself under the bus. I should have forced this board to put those guardrails up earlier, and I didn't. Um, and I allowed the task force to kind of have to take the brunt, brunt of all that and be, be cornered into saying, yeah, let's go test it. Well, they, you know, they didn't, they didn't really test the number that day. Right. So then we, we created these um, well-intentioned guardrails of 100 to 150, and then the task force says, we understand you, but we, we kind of found this 170, 180 range. So I think we should find something in that 180 range that kind of gets us most of what we want and then come up with the plan B that's in the, the 150 range. And I will I will oppose that. Okay. Um, I, I don't think we should test anything that I will not vote to put on the ballot in, in November. Like taking away stages from O'Neill, right? <laughs> no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So... So okay, let, then let's let's take that a step further. What would you support at this point in time? I mean, I, I feel like we had a really long conversation. We had those guardrails up, and we we were um, thinking about a whole number of factors in terms of um, having a, having a good story to tell to the community, uh, but also keeping keeping our taxpayers um, at the front of the conversation. Seventy percent of whom don't have kids in our schools. Um, so I. I'm not comfortable seeing. I was out at 150, and I was always leery. But 180, I, I'm out. I, guys, I understand what you're saying. Um, this is not for us to go put on the ballot. This is for us to fill the void of what we don't know. And for us, no, to I, I, no, I completely understand. That. I'm just, I'm not going to, I'm not in favor of testing something. I'm not going to put on the ballot. I'm not going to support put on the ballot. So I mean, like, what if we test it though, and we get good feedback? Okay. You I mean, still I, want to put it on the ballot? I. I guess I would. I guess I mean we're not going to get a, a hundred percent of people in the community supporting it. I guess you can count me in the forty-five to forty percent of, of the community that doesn't support a, a, a tax piece of that large. Okay, so what? Okay, get your pencil out. What would be at one? What What's the price Oppor point you're looking? I was I threw out opportunity C. We're so still getting we're still getting rate reconfiguration. What we're losing is is um, something that I. I, un I understand this is a big one, but I mean, we're losing probably air conditioning. Um, but I don't know. Maybe maybe I'm um, going against the conventional wisdom here. But you know, we keep talking about once in a generation, once in a generation. <coughs> why? I mean, why couldn't we go back in five, ten years and say, okay, we've done a lot of work. Now our now our buildings, um, we need a little bit more work in order to have air conditioning. Why not another? I don't know. Is that, it, it, it's, just to, to make the impact not as great at one time. I don't know. So the opportunity C at 129 is the original plan for six, eight middle schools, no air conditioning and no miscellaneous interior. So would you be willing to um, consider adding bathrooms yes. onto that? Because if we're going to do the plumbing, I think, I think, I think that I th Steve has been in El Sierra and it's the same bathroom he used. <laughs> no, that was Fairmont. I went to Fairmont. I what was that last month? Um, I, I, you know, you definitely noticed that when um, when I went to the the Lester Daddy Daughter Dance last month, I was not really excited. Was this month? I was not really yeah. excited to use the washrooms. Um, I think that's 
those are in pretty poor condition. I, I would I could get behind that absolutely. So so on opportunity C, Miss Interiors is out. Would you just take that line item of the nine point three? Say that again. On opportunity C, no miscellaneous interiors is is uh is X'd out. So would you just add in the line item for bathroom remodels and not do all other stuff that's under MISC interiors? That's technically possible, right? Yeah. Yeah. Which one is that? I'm sorry. I, I'm, I have the benefit of this thing. Yeah. Opportunity C. Yeah. And then right there. In, um, you talk about storage, flooring, ceiling repairs. So just, so she's, she's saying just bathroom remodels. I, I mean, I am... I am not looking to to derail this conversation. If I'm the lone person who's saying 180 is out, you don't need me. If you want to test 180, 150, and 120. I was going to say, I love and I respect everything that comes out of your mouth, Greg, and I, if my kid was in your class, I would have been thrilled. Um, but I don't think we need to be making decisions based off of one person's want. Um, but uh, for to have other no. options, just to have, because Paul that, we're cutting down, that we would use I'm thinking only like no Let's do an A, B, and a C. And let's, yeah. right. I mean, let's, let's hear from the community. And, if, and Emily, to your point, if the community's voice is very strongly in favor of, of, the, of the option A, I guess I'll have to reconsider and, and listen to what people are telling us. We don't know. I mean, yeah. But um, that, them, the one that you guys are building is something that is in the range that I'm more comfortable. I'm not going to lie. When we first started doing this, I expected this more to be in like the 75 to 120 range. Mm-hmm. And then I saw the real numbers There's coming back. Buildings. And I went and had had to have breathing treatments and, and <laughs> relax for a few minutes and had to, you know, rethink all of this. So, you know, I... Yeah. I well, and again, you know. if people are so concerned about, you know, property and their property values... In 20 years of our schools haven't really changed except for maybe some of the things inside and now we have six to eight. Nobody's going to want to move to Downers Grove. <coughs> they're going to look at every single school district around us and that's where they're going to go and they are, are already doing that. And that's why, so I, that's a problem. That's why I fully support like and there's increasing, so many I mean I wasn't there in like that 75 right. to 100 range. I was there. But the, hearing exactly what you just said about like man. Wouldn't it be awesome to send my kids to right. to Herrick and O'Neill under under the vision that Amy and White have laid out for us? And I can see that as a parent who has kids right. who are going to be in, in, in middle school in a couple of years, and I can see that as a parent um, <coughs> before I had kids, I can see myself right. being really jazzed about that. So that's why I am fully willing right. to have ex- greatly expanded my, my original Im- imagination imagined number for what we should be going for. Um, and Paul did say that that the the some of the, someone in the task force did make mention that if it's something that all students will have, maybe it won't be immediate. You know, as far as the 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 well, that's what's kind of nice school, about the sixth grade middle schools because everybody there's two of them. It's it's easier for the community to kind of see the impact that it's going to have. Every kid will go through right. one of those two buildings. Um, I think yeah, even whether you're the most con- conservative amongst us on the board, I think you look at this and you say, we know we have maintenance things to do, but there are some core things that have that have to be done or we're going to start having a negative impact on property value eventually in the long run if we can't we provide already do with those the best, you know, the best services. You know, so. Park tests and the school scores and that's what people look at. That's what pops up when yeah. you are looking for houses. Are those little d- round things that show that surrounding school districts that I know aren't better than District 58, and their scores are ridiculously higher than ours. And that's what people look at when they're buying a house. Paul, if you went and tested a small, medium, large approach, like an A, B, and a C, are those three different... Do you take three different subgroups and test different ones amongst different people, or do you start at a big number and then say, if you wouldn't... How about this? And then how about that? I would, I would, so I, what I would never do is um, test them all, like, together, for example, in a mail survey. We would never mention all three plans, because what you would get is 30, 30, you know, 33, mm-hmm. 33, 33 kind of thing, right? You're like, oh, right. now what do we do? Which, we, uh, which I've seen happen, we won't mention the school district, but they were adamant that I go test three different options, and it was not good. But when I say that, on the phone poll, as I mentioned, there are strategies to take three options. Please don't have the you know, newspaper go report that you're, you have these three options you're going to go test, right, because it biases the poll. But in a perfect world, you're going to pick kind of your plan A, 
It might be a little too high than what you're comfortable with, but that's your plan A. And then in the phone poll, um, we can split the sample and we'll test, you know, whatever it is, 178 versus 151 or something. And we'll see if we move them at all. And then also in that split sample, we'll have a follow-up question for both of those subgroups in which we ask, if we were to reduce this to 98 million and just focus on maintenance as well as a safe and secure entryways, would you support it? We're gonna, and at, at first blush, I said we just don't, we just asked those that said no, I'm decided, but I don't want to do that. I want to ask everybody at the end that question, and then we'll look at the data. Yeah. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Last year. Oh, can you hear us? All right, okay. I was just saying that when we when we <laughs> went with District 99, as I mentioned before, we split the sample, and it was pretty close in terms of that whole, you know, remember they went for the 136, and then they were looking at the one that was 98 or something, um, and the data came back and said, you know, it's pretty much the same. And so they said, well, what the heck, let's go for it. So we don't know, you know, we'll get the data back, we'll look at it, Jim Hobart will be there to... You know, fill in all the blanks. I'll share with the, you the uh, feedback on the mail survey. The mail survey will um, will probably just focus on the main, um, <coughs> you know, the main proposal, the plan A. Um, but you know, is what it is. That's in the and again, the mail survey will not be um, uh, a scientific uh, poll, but rather one that just provides a general undertone. <coughs> hey, Paul, quick question: Do you have any experience? Uh, working in a community that has had two two school districts that have gone to referendum so closely to each other. Um, so I always tell clients there's never a good time to be on the ballot. Uh, you know, we have coronavirus right now. Um, kind of go down the list, right? There's never a good time. And yes, all the time there's competing tax measures that are happening, um, whether it be a, another school district or, or it be a, uh, you know, fill in the blank, right? Um, it's just, it's always happening, so it's just never a good time to be able to one. I just want to do a quick straw poll if everyone's, are more people comfortable having a starting point in that 170 something to 180 range or starting off with our option A being around the 138, that would be the C plus the bathrooms, which is what we were just talking about. So. My starting point is 180. Yeah. yeah, I would say 170, 180 is a safe starting point if there isn't, like, you know, like I've also been the fear that we're going to scare people off instantaneously with that number. Okay. In my math, I came up with 178.6. And that's for maintenance, bathroom remodels. Secure vestibules, air conditioning, and the original plan. Okay. So you're saying maintenance, like up to miscellaneous interiors, but then including bathrooms. Only the green. Maintenance is the highlighted stuff. Only it's the green maintenance. Side. So not oh. interior, or exterior lighting. Correct. Okay. okay. Just the life, just the state mandated repairs in gotcha. green. Plus that we have to do. Plus bathrooms. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. That would be my plan A. And then we can scale it back. That 138.9, it would be your plan B, that C plus bathrooms? Option C plus bathrooms? That, yeah, mm -hmm. I would do C plus bathrooms. Okay. And then uh, a final opportunity of opportunity F, which is just kind of the, the bare bones stuff to make sure that we get our buildings kind of up to code and, and, and secure our entrances is on the... On our low end, 98.4 million. C plus bathroom doesn't get us to 180. Plus no. air C plus bathroom gets us to 138. Yeah. It's the... It's the air conditioning. Yeah, that gets us to 190. Uh, oh, you took out interior lighting. Though. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, sorry. Okay. And then so... So I'm hearing... And I'm going to go around to everybody, but what I'm what I'm hearing from you is option A would be 178.6, option B uh, would be C plus bathrooms, that would be 138.9, and option C would be what we're calling opportunity F at that 98.4 million. Okay. 
that's that's where you're comfortable at tracing. Those would that would be my parameter. A, my B, levels. and C. Okay, Steve. I, I think that's fantastic. I, I you know I you know hate to agree with Karat again. But I, I think I, I don't think we're signing ourselves up for anything, right? Like we're trying to fill the void of what we don't know. And I was actually surprised to kind of get the feedback. Yeah, we need to go for the 170 or 180 from the task force. I I recognize that the task force may not be fully representative of the the voting base, so I still don't know what the um, the appetite is from the community. So I think we test that 180. That helps us start to connect the dots a little bit more. I'm going to take that as a compliment. <laughs> Gail? You, you, also also need, uh, you also need 75% support for your base to win. So, you know, again, the parent should not be discarded in the discussion. What do you think, Jill? Agree. Thank you. What was the uh, third package there? Just that option F. That's the one that gets us... Uh, some basic maintenance, including the state mandated repairs, gets us the secured vest in the secured vestibule fuels. There's no grade school re uh, with a, the oh. opportunity to see. There's no AC and no uh, middle schools. It's mm -hmm. literally uh, safe and secure vestibules and maintenance. Yeah, the life safety. I would rather. I, I mean, personally, I would like just A and B as choices, and C is not an option well, for me. The way that they would test it, though, is if somebody right. says no to one right. of the first two. Right. Then you ask them, would you at least be open to X? And if we right. get a no on that as well, then we really know right. we have challenge. But I, yes, but just out of principle, I would not even. No, I you're, you're kind of using similar yeah. thinking as, yeah. as Greg that yeah. that's not something that you would personally support. Right. And Tracy, you're saying, so your option A, 178.6, is mandated maintenance plus bathrooms plus secure vestibules plus AC plus 68. Yes? I can sh I can show. It. I, I, I think I'm looking at the same. I looked at Alec right. Hart, so I yeah. I did. Would, this. would it be possible to actually project this? Because I think this is a pretty important <laughs> piece of information. There's a lot of green on there. I, I can't even tell. James, can you do it, or we don't lose Paul? No. Do you know what we need right now? We'll use an overhead projector. As long as you can still hear Paul in the audio. I know. I um. I know exactly what um. Tracy's been talking about. So. Okay. Go ahead. I, I use the opportunity. This was the yeah. sheet that the task force had there to make their own. Thank you. Yes. Who made that so, so my. So mine is all of this. I took. I took. Um, I took playgrounds off. Oh, playgrounds off. Okay. I took playgrounds off. Okay. I did the electrical. That that's still in green. Yeah. I did bathroom remodels. That's in there. So get rid of lighting. Yep. I did this. I did this. Yeah. And I did that. Okay. And I came up with 178.6. So are you saying just the playground or the field paving as well? All that is off. Get rid of all this stuff. Yes. Okay. So is that like a two or six or something? I can try to zoom in. Zoom in. I'm sure they want us to keep that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. That's my hat. That's my happy meal. Uh, Mr. Bardo, the uh, so one of the things she crossed off was the playground stuff that's in our highlighted area. Now, I playgrounds isn't always what we think of playgrounds. Is that problematic for us to, to take that off that list? Because I don't know if that's like curbing and, and so we took space safety. And, yeah, like so we yeah. took uh, the actual playground improvements out. So we would have to go back to White and Company to detail that. Um, where are we at? 3.8, yeah. right? Because it does include a lot of significant paving work right. around the buildings, um, which some people would also consider a playground because we have days where that's, uh, you know, black hard top surface, yeah, blacktop only or hard surface only. Right. Mm -hmm. So although the verbiage says playgrounds, I think probably a significant portion of that is more towards uh, the paved portion in yeah. the uh, playground okay. fields. You said paved portion. So you might... And this is 6.5 yeah. in line. Yeah, the 3.8 doesn't include the playgrounds. The 6.5 has playgrounds in it. I see. So, it's so we can do 3.8 instead so of 6.5. just scratch the word playgrounds on it. If we need well, but to. She was saying in her plan she took the 3.8 oh, out altogether. So yeah. if, if that, that has highlight. to be in there, then yeah. it does come to 182.4. Okay. So, 
one of the things I want to I want to remind the board. Yes. I would not be hung up on 181 versus 179 versus give the ballpark number because you have to remember a couple things. Um, in all of these assumptions, you are dealing with labor that's estimated from four to five years out. Right. You're dealing with things that no matter what happens during this process, if you go there, you're going to have prices that are going to come in um, lower than what you expected, and you're going to have prices that are going to come in higher. So there's a lot of things that you're going to be adjusting here. I would not get into the weeds this much about right. you're asking him back to Steve's original point. Um, what are the big buckets that we're yes, looking for? Those three. In your big buckets, Tracy, you did a nice job outlining them. Years one through eight maintenance, security, AC bathrooms, and the six eight middle school concept. That that's what you're asking for. I, I wouldn't get in the weeds about half a million dollars in playgrounds and that. that those are things that. And, and, and I, apo I apologize for asking to put that on the screen, but I just want everyone to kind of no, I, connect the I mean, dots. I'm sure that they're seeing where we're getting these numbers from. But <laughs> so when it comes to testing, though, real quick, um, I think we may want to then consider because we will have an opportunity to tweak a little bit and stuff like that. Um, so we may want to just test some generic numbers that get us close to that and test at like 179, 139, and 99, you know, because that's basically where we're at anyway. Because um, once we go out to actually build something, we would build something more uh, concise um, at that point anyway. Yeah, I like getting below that 180 um, ceiling. Yeah, because we can tweak some things. If that sells really well, we can we can we can tweak some little things inside there to uh, to get it cheaper. So if we if we did like like that, like one seventy nine, one thirty nine, ninety nine, does something like that? Would that flow make sense? I don't know that we have consensus on the board. That's just a question for you. To move forward. Yeah, I like it. Yay. All right. I just I, I want to go around the table again. Um, what we're talking about is doing a general table where we would describe um, what Tracy was just talking about as an option A around 179 million, and option B around 139 million, which would be that that option C, but we would update the bathrooms, and then an option C that would be test around 99 million dollars. Is there and those three thing. buckets? No, no, you're asking us if, if, if that's how we feel. If, if, if okay. people would be comfortable. Can you say that one more time. Sure. Option A is um, doing all the basic maintenance stuff, along with doing six to eight middle schools Numbers. and air conditioning, and that would we would test it around 179. Safety and safety security. And safety and security, right? All the green stuff plus six eight and air conditioning and bathrooms, and that would be a, testing that at 179 million. Option B would be to look at all the stuff that's highlighted in opportunity C, but also add in um, bathroom remodeling for an additional $9.8 million, which we would test at $139 million. And Wait, then can, I, can I, so opportunity C that they're saying for the, uh, like the people in the, is six, eight middle schools, yep. no air conditioning, and no miscellaneous improvements. With the exception With of With the exception models. of adding bathrooms to get us to 138.9. Yes. Okay, okay and then sorry, no problem. That's perfect. Uh, and then that opportunity F was like our bare bones stuff, doing the security and the core maintenance stuff that we needed to do, and we would test that around ninety nine million dollars. May I go first? Yeah, go ahead. I, didn't, I didn't participate in the first drop hole. Yeah. Um, I I'll, I'll concede the point um, of, of, of testing that. That's fine. I just wanted just to state for the record that my. Um, for my kids and for Cross kids and Emily's kids, I want everything. Mm -hmm. I want 226. And if it was up to me alone, I would get my, out my paycheck and I would pay this amount every year happily. Um, I, I, any, everything I've said tonight has been um, concern out of uh, Joe and Jane taxpayer um, and, and my commitment to um, being extremely responsible with their money. But if this is if this is where our community is telling us to where we need to go, then I'll I'll, I'll think very hard about it. But I I, I can I can. Uh, Support um, the decision of, of the, the rest of the board of testing it. Correct. Right. Can, can, because of what you just shared, though, I want to be careful. What I'm here is not being a uh, good fiduciary of taxpayer dollars. But I mean, we have to. I mean, I, the, the conversation's been tossed out there several times that we need to invest in our schools in order to protect the investment of the community. Because if our schools are falling apart, no one's going to send their kids mm -hmm. to school here. And everybody's invested in their homes or invested in their schools. Mm -hmm. and we have to protect that investment by 
you know, if it was my house and my kitchen was falling apart, I have to spend money to, to make my house look nice if, if I ever want to sell it. Or if my roof is, is collapsing, I need to buy a new roof. I have to spend money to protect that investment. He's saying it is. A we good are. Investment. We are. What is it, um, Kevin? We are one of two districts that do not have air conditioning in DuPage County. So in DuPage County, in, in we have to add with a caveat there. Um, not every building in DuPage County is going to have 100% air conditioning. But when you look at the majority, or when you look at the schools in in DuPage County, yes. West Chicago School District and Downers 58 are the ones that are lagging behind in air conditioning. And then Woodridge and uh, Downers Grove are the only ones that don't have a 6-8 middle school concept or a uh, middle school concept that incorporates 5th or 4th grade, because some schools will even go down as low yeah. as 4th uh, grade. Like a K-3-3. Three, three. Yeah. yeah. So we have put out surveys and questions to everyone on that air conditioning question to date. West Chicago has been the only one that has come back to us saying that we don't have air. 99 now has full air, so they would have been another one that would have came back. But I cannot tell the board right now that if I went to every school in DuPage County that there isn't a wing here or a room there. But when you're talking about a comprehensive air conditioning plan, right now we believe it's awesome West Chicago and West Chicago is moving on getting that air conditioning. So the, so the education piece will be important because um, I remember even before I was on the board reading the HYA uh, surveys and uh, focus groups and everything else and air conditioning was one of the <coughs> biggest things on that before I was even on the board and that was like three years ago. People have been talking about air conditioning for a very long time. So I am very comfortable and I am very confident in all of these different A, B, and C because of all the data that we've all been talking about tonight. And and facts. And it's facts. It's based in fact. It's, it's not a feeling. It's not an emotion. It is a fact. It's also very present in our environment survey that we put out in, November, in December. Yeah, right? it made all the comments. I guess I would, I would take a different uh, lens that I think everyone agrees that we should have air conditioning until you see the price tag. And I think that's what Paul's polling is going to tell us through these three options is to everyone's going to say they want air conditioning until they see the price tag. So right. I think by pushing forward with these three options and getting more data, we'll, we'll have a 100% um, answer as to whether they fully support right. it. So structuring the way to tear off right. air exactly. AC and say, would you, if Correct. the difference between A and B right. is a yes vote yes. versus a no vote, yeah. we know AC isn't, that sticker price is too much. Okay. So keep in mind mm -hmm. a, a couple of things, and, and this is why I think you're making a, a wise decision to at least test that. Um, since the task force meeting, you got all the emails I got. Um, everyone is telling you, don't be short-sighted. This is your chance to ask. Um, so uh, again, I, I think if you're operating under the premise of it doesn't hurt to ask, and then like Pratt said, you can feel some stuff back. The other thing, um, the community and the board always need to keep in mind with HVAC. Um, we just have the heating component of the HVAC. We right. don't have the air conditioning. So Kevin and I, uh, Kevin Bardo, our director of buildings and grounds, have had several conversations. In 2020, it's not like when you bought these things in the 60s where you had the option, do you want air in these things? They don't make them separate anymore. They're almost impossible to find. So when you are buying new units and unit ventilators, they're coming with a dual purpose. That was the whole um, community um, conversation about Lester and about Pierce Downer when those were added. When you do new construction, you don't have a choice of adding one or the other. So just keep that in mind that... Um, it's good to at least test it because I guess what I'm trying to say in a roundabout way is um, you're going to have to replace a lot of these unit ventilators no matter what, and if you do that, they're going to come with that dual capacity. So it's a good thing to get that out there. You're learning a lot about HVAC, huh? Actually, that was one thing I, I've, done, I've had a lot of work in <laughs> with HVAC. Never thought I would, but uh, HVAC I know a lot about. You know, we, so we just generally have an air movement problem in a lot of our buildings. I mean, they're, they're old, mm -hmm. and that's another thing that this would address. I think that I think what's shocking for me is I don't think there's a person sitting in this room that, that doesn't think we should have better airflow and, and air conditioning inside buildings. I think what everybody is shocked by is I don't think anyone, when people have been coming to me through the couple of years that I've been on the board and going, why don't we have air conditioning? I think it's because nobody expected that's a $50 million um, bill, you know, and I... It, like, I knew it was big, and I knew it was a big bill that was coming with that, but even I was like, are you kidding me? Like, like that, that is a huge... And I, we have a lot of buildings and stuff like that. You just don't... You, you think about your... I'm making you that mad. <laughs> um, you don't think about... Like, you think about the impacts that it has on your on your house, like put in air conditioning. Okay, ten, you know, 10 grand, I can put a new 
um, device in or whatever, it's a little bit different when you're talking about The other thing, too, is it's, it's all about the story that we tell. And, and I would encourage everyone, when you leave this center today, to take a walk behind this building right now. What you see behind this building, you will see hay bales along the back of this building. Yes. Why do we have hay bales? So the pipes don't freeze in the wintertime. That is a real thing that you're not going to see in many places in 2020. So yeah. Downers Grove has been an unbelievable steward of the taxpayers' money. The reason these buildings are still able to function as they are is because previous boards in the town have done everything they possibly can to the greatest extent possible to take care of these buildings. Um, the scenario that I like to compare it to a lot is you know, you, you ride that car for 200, 300, maybe 400,000 miles, but eventually, you know, you may not have had a car payment in a very long time, but you got to buy a new car eventually. And, and that's where you're at almost as a school district right now. So, again, you're not talking synthetic fields. You're not talking... Well, game puck cafeterias. Th th those types of things. You, you, you're talking Recently very bare bones, simple, simple kind of stuff. Again, though, it's a big number. And the reason it's a big number is because we haven't done this since 1992. So what does he need now? What does Paul need? Yes. What, what are, what, what's the action on this then? Paul. Paul? Uh, the action is just that you. I want you to you know confirm that the 1786 is or 179 rather is um, kind of what your plan A is that is going to take the focus that will be the focus of the various mailers, presentations, etc. And it's not going to be plan A, plan B, plan C. Oh. Yeah, you're saying we're going to lead with our plan A and all of our documents. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Paul, to that point, though, um, you know, if I could direct the board's attention to that next step slide that you would see in, in board docs. Paul, one piece of clarification that I, I also think we're going to need to have from the Board of Education is um, there's some action steps on the next step side from the task force. James, would you mind if you can put putting that up? Um, our next step is calling for a letter attachment mailed to all District 58 registered voter households uh, by April 7th. That's prior to our next meeting. An FAQ's newsletter sent out on April 14th. Website updates, uh, April and ongoing. Presentations to the community, ongoing. Mail surveys. So some of these are going to require um, action prior to the next board meeting. So I, I do think your um, action step here has to be more inclusive of, of a simple um, phone poll, if that makes sense. Huh? No, you're, you had me until the end. <laughs> <laughs> so so what, what, Paul what, we, what Paul's asking you to do yeah. is to take a board action. And yes. I apologize if I'm, if okay. I'm not being crystal clear. Sometimes in my head it's not. And I have that here. <laughs> um, you also, though, if you look at April 7th, Right. You're calling for a letter and attachment to be mailed to all right. District 58 households. So yeah. you're also going to have to authorize me as the superintendent to write that letter and get mm -hmm. that out there prior to your next meeting because we'll have a meeting on Monday. We have a meeting Monday. Then. You do have a meeting on Monday. We could get it by Monday. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah, as long as the board is comfortable with um, putting an action item, and then you wouldn't get the letter until the weekend, as long as you're okay with that. Yeah. So you get the letter. Oh. You'd get the letter before the meeting. Yeah. Will you vote on it on Monday? Yeah. Okay. Paul, did you hear that? Yeah. I, when you say you'll get the letter, does that mean they're going to review the letter? Is that what you're saying? Well, if we're going to send the letter out on April 7th, they've got to vote on it because the last opportunity they're going to have is March 9th. Correct. Unless there's another What's the date today? <laughs> it's April 5th. Um, okay. You can do that. It'll have an, you know, it, again, we took a shot at it. I loved whoever said, wow. That last letter is just way too long, way too complicated. So I've already, I've already kind of rewritten that, and now we'll obviously fill in the blanks of what you on the recommendation that you've just made. Uh, same with the attachment; we can quickly, um, we can qu quickly, you know, make that match the letter. Yeah, because we don't have another meeting until the 13th of April. Okay. Um, okay. And when is the when's the next when is your next meeting after that? After the 7th is the 13th of April. 
Okay. So. Monday the 9th. No, no, no. After April 7th, the next one would be April 13th. Oh, did I? Uh, okay. Whatever. You're yeah, right. <laughs> Monday. Yeah, we have a meeting on Monday, but the one after the seventh is going to be the thirteenth of April. Okay, I just asked because you know, um, if you're needing to sign off and every every mailing that goes out, then, out. Um, then that April fourteenth date will never be hit because you have so many people you'd have to mail to that that we you know it takes a while for the printer to do its thing. Yeah, no, Paul. I'm not suggesting we would mail these on Monday. No, no, no. I'm just saying, like, on the April 14th? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but based on your schedule for your next meeting, we're not going to have a newsletter ready yet. Um, so we'll be, you know, Monday? developing this newsletter. Um, and if you need board approval for the newsletter, well, yeah. you want to mail on April 14th. That, that April 14th date is never going to happen. Got it. What's a, we What's don't have a working letter in the FAQ? We have a budget no. worksheet. Oh, no, no, we don't. We don't have anything. There's spring. Right. The last March, week is no. spring April. break. All right. Okay. Paul, Coretta uh, asked, what's the difference between the letter and the FAQ newsletter? Uh, so the FAQ newsletter will be uh, 25 and a half by 11, kind of folds into an 8 and a half by 11, then folds again to 8 and a half by 5 and a half. Okay. has all this real estate to really now include all sorts of photos and infographics and a Q and A, it's a it's always a really strong piece, and it's we know it's read, um, and so I would definitely not, I would definitely not not do it. Right, I, it's a it's a very important piece. So we might just have to push it out a little farther than April fourteenth. Right, saying. we might just have to you know the mail date's going to have to mm -hmm. be a little bit after yeah, that. that. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. And, that, and then obviously the mail survey will in turn be delayed just a little bit just right. to. All right, so when we come out of discussion, what we're going to do is we're going to be taking action to approve them to start working on an community engagement plan. And those were going to range around option A being the 179, option B being the 139, option C being the 99. Um, I'll define what each of those things are, but that's what we'd be taking there. To approve them would just be to start a communication plan um, for them to start engaging the community obviously does not mean that we have to take action on any three of those items. Um, I know we have some people uncomfortable on the low end, and we have some of the board uncomfortable on the high end. Um, so, but this gives us an opportunity to hear uh, feedback from everybody. Is that where we are at, consensus-wise, kind of thing? All right, and let me just take note of what our opportunities are. Not quite yet, unless. Well. Oh, you? <laughs> he is done. Well, is he? Well, is Paul done? <laughs> I, don't, I don't make that call. <laughs> okay. Paul asked if you still want him on. You still want him on. Uh, through the motion, Paul, then yeah. we'll, uh, we'll, we'll let you go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so hold on. 179, and this is. Uh, 
Thank you, Darren. Thank you. All right. Um, going on to our recommendations for action, up first is going to be the facility planning communicate community engagement plan. Is there a motion to approve the community engagement plan consisting of option A, $179 million that includes all of the highlighted maintenance area plus six through eight uh, reconfiguration original plan plus AC plus the bathrooms? Plus safety and security. That's in the highlighted uh, maintenance, highlight. yeah. Um, option B, which includes all of opportunities uh, Option B, which includes all of Opportunity C plus bathrooms, that does not include AC, and that is for $139 million. And Option C, which is known in the paperwork as Opportunity F, that is just the highlighted maintenance area. That highlighted area does include security, and we would test that at $99 million. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion? No. We discussed it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Melissa, please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchek. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried to approve the community engagement plan consisting of option A for $179 million, which will include all of the highlighted maintenance areas, uh, the six through eight. Uh, model reconfiguration in its original format, the AC and bathrooms. Option B, uh, which will, which in the paperwork was known as Opportunity C, but adding additionally the bathrooms with no AC for $139 million. Uh, and option C, which was previously known as Opportunity F, which is the core highlighted maintenance areas, including that security and safety, um, for $99 million. Okay. We have additional discussion tonight. The next discussion item. Yes, we did. Uh, I just had to read that twice. So yeah. <laughs> <lost it>, <laughs> uh, our next discussion item up is the administrative centers, both AC, uh, ASC and Longfellow. So you want to kick us off? Yeah, so, um, and, and thank you. I, I know we have several members of the public that are here for um, this conversation, and uh, we appreciate that. There will be a time for public comment at the end of uh, this conversation. Um, no action tonight is being taken on anything with our administrator center. Oh, yeah. So, um, well, just why, why don't we say goodbye? <laughs> oh, Paul, you can go. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Okay. <laughs> he just leaves and goes home. <laughs> Thank you, James. So, along with our um, master facility plan, there has been a parallel track going on um, that has taken a backseat, understandably, to the master facility plan because, in our view, um, the schools, the children, the staff obviously comes first. Um, the parallel track, though, along with the master facility plan, is what to do with our administrative centers here in District 58. Functionally, it does not make sense to run two administrative centers. We, we've kind of gotten there by default um, over the uh, last several years. Um, so for those in the audience, um, this is the ASC. This is where the bulk of our administrative staff is. Um, this building has obviously been here for a while. Uh, way back when, this was a shared building between District 99 and District 58. District 99 moved out in the um, late 90s across the street, and so now they have their administrative center over here, and then District 58 has remained here. Uh, the Longfellow Center has served as our second administrative center slash storage area for curriculum materials slash maintenance slash technology center um, and pretty much a catch-all for anything else that you can um, think of. The Longfellow Center um, presents many logistical challenges for the school district, not just the function of our two administrative centers, but the age of that building and uh, the maintenance required uh, for that building. So having a building that is at its end of life does present um, challenges in terms of are you going to continue to maintain that building or are you going to do something about that building? And so that's not a new conversation to Downers Grove. That, that's been a conversation that's been going on uh, for a very, very long time. 
Um, and there are passionate voices on, on both sides of the argument about maintaining Longfellow or perhaps selling Longfellow and in um, getting that off the District 58 books. The reason why this conversation has accelerated in the past several weeks is because the village of Downers Grove is in talks about building a new village hall slash police station. And they have asked both school districts, 99 and 58, to consider a partnership with them. Um, and yes, for those of you who have been around Downers Grove, this does sound like deja vu all over again because this is not the first time that uh, we've had those conversations either. Um, this time, I, I would say the difference is that the village, you do have a large appetite on the village board to build a new um, facility. I also think Longfellow is getting older and older and older, and so is this building and how we're using those. So the conversation um, that we need to have as a school <coughs> district um, is kind of twofold. Um, do we want to really engage in serious talks with the village about a partnership on an administrative center um, that would be a combined Village Hall Police Station and District 58 Administrative Center. Um, if we do that, that would pretty much make, um, if, if we were to get there, it would make Longfellow obsolete because you could then use this building for your curricular storage, your maintenance, and things like that. And there's also a possibility you could share this facility with the village in, in, in their maintenance shop, not their fleet, their maintenance um, shop. There are certainly advantages to partnering with the village in, in terms of an administrative center, just the shared space alone when you're talking about common reception areas, common bathrooms, um, common boardrooms, common educational centers, which is another big piece of what we use Longfellow for. It serves as our professional development center. So obviously there are advantages. We estimate that we would need um, for an administrative center about a 17,000 to 18,000 square foot facility. If we partnered with the village, that would go down to about 7,000 or 8,000 square feet because we would share the remaining square footage um, with reception area, educational centers, mm -hmm. bathrooms, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So there are opportunities to engage in a leasing conversation with the village on, on a shared um, <coughs> administrative center. We are also still actively pursuing what we would consider our next best alternatives. Um, should we just build our own administrative center? Should we rehab an existing building somewhere in the town and make that our administrative center? Should we rent a facility and, and make that our administrative center? Or should we go into a school and carve out a section of that school for our administrative center? When you look at our next best alternatives, really that option, the last one going into a school, um, would be the cheapest. The second cheapest option would be to end a leasing agreement with the village based on some of the preliminary numbers um, that we have. Now, any of that rehab money, though, is going to require, or leasing is going to require revenue from some source. So, so the question becomes, you know, what assets do we have as a school district that you could potentially use to fund an administrative center or some of your other maintenance projects? And that is where the Longfellow site um, does need to be discussed. Um, and I say that recognizing, again, the, the strong arguments for and against on that, but this conversation um, is a board conversation for sure, um, but the administrative situation in the district um, does need to be addressed, and uh, the facility needs are real for this building, as I pointed out, and also the Longfellow Center. So that's kind of a very general, uh, broad introduction. Um, would we be having this conversation right at this moment if the village wasn't um, accelerating their talk? Probably not. You'd probably wait till after some of the uh, other facility things got taken care of, but because this is a unique opportunity, it does make sense to really have those conversations now. Okay. We've had a little bit of conversation about this, and, and obviously Steve and I are, are on the FAC committee. Um, there, there was a little bit of it right when you came on, and you said on FAC prior to being on the board, right? You yeah, it was right when Karat came on the board. So when right, July. and so we did have a couple of breakout sub-sessions about Longfellow then, but um, uh, in, in discussing the fact that uh, its overall cost for this district is continuing to get higher, and uh, the idea, the last time they put a roof on that building was that it would be the, uh, the previous board prior to any of us sitting on here um, was really their hope that it would be the last time they ever had to put a roof on that building um, because maintaining that building has become uh, 
especially it, you know it's one thing if it meets all of our needs and, and but when it doesn't meet your needs and it's, and it's been very expensive to maintain it's been uh, a concern I know of a, a lot of members of the board and our community so um, so that's one part of it but this was an opportunity to, to see if we had any uh, concerns or questions that we wanted to, to bring up regarding the potential long-term lease uh, with, with the village and the police department. Did you say questions or? Well, y we can have questions that we could bring back to David Fieldman at some point or we could, it, you know, uh, the village manager, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we, we could bring it. We could bring. Uh, we could have the administration bring questions back to him. Um, we could ask Todd or Kevin or Kevin any questions that we may have on the, the status of where they're at or concerns that we may have about being in a leasing agreement with them. What so that might look like, et cetera, et cetera. We are only talking about a leasing agreement with them right now. So, a couple of things. What, what we're looking for guidance from the board, and again, we're not asking for a vote, but you know, should we be? engaging the village on all sorts of different options in terms of a shared facility. Right now, the, a leasing agreement makes the most sense given that it's currently on their land, it would be their building, um, th that kind of stuff. We would still pursue any options, whether that be an, a joint ownership, a condo type of relationship, all of those. We would certainly bring back all of those, but before we dedicate you know, more staff time to that, I is that something that you want us to pursue. The next question that we'd like some guidance on is in terms of the Longfellow Center, what would you like us to do in terms of that building and how would you like us to um, use our time uh, for that? And what I'm specifically asking for, should we be looking at ways to maintain that center? Should we be looking at ways to perhaps sell that center? Um, something in between that we haven't thought of, you know, all those different things, that's what we're asking for. I think to drive that discussion, I think it'd be good if Todd kind of maybe gave us the, the cliff notes of the memo. I know it's uh, <laughs> six six pages was actually short for a Todd memo. <laughs> <laughs> That's after uh, Melissa I oh, was able to uh, laugh. I did try to give an executive summary. Um, I liked it. So and and the memo is is portion essentially pieces of two that have come out in separate pieces. You know. Um, you know one part of it is, you know, looking at the options that are available uh, in the master's facility plan. At the end, um, you know, there is a page that talks about uh, options. Obviously, the the connection and work with the the city was not on that. You know, was not an option at that point in time. Uh, but the opportunities that and options that we uh, looked at and what those costs might be uh, as part of that master facility plan, knowing that we needed to encapsulate that into the plan in some level, um, and knowing that it's a, it's an something of an inevitability that we have to come to uh, some movement in a direction, um, given the structure that we have. Um, so you have a table in it towards the end that I know you've seen previously. Um, that gives those op that lays out those options of of the opportunities, whether it's long term lease, acquire a, a, a current structure uh, within the community and, and renovate it, uh, build on you know build at the Longfellow facility, you know take that building down and put a new district facility uh, there, which is one, uh, interesting one of the more expensive options, uh, or add on to this facility and. Reutilize this in a different format. Um, given the the shared cost piece uh, with the village, um, that that opportunity is it becomes. It, it, I should say the other option is, of course, is taking a section of a of a of a current school building uh, and adjusting that to administrative and support uh, services. That is the cheapest piece. It is, you know, the least amount of work to do. Um, this, the, the you mean to move in? To move in. It's not the least amount of work because it will, uh, it would require a families a being affected absolutely. by changing. So yes. why it's so that's, that's that's also why it's not a recommendation. Let me add a caveat. <laughs> in, in, um, if, if you were going to take over a portion of a school, yeah. <coughs> it would take um, redistricting 
in changing boundaries to school um, and rethinking of a concept uh, of, of a school. So perhaps you would take one school, and, and again, this is high-level conceptual stuff, so please no one run out of this room and say this is what they're doing with the, with the school because that's not what we're doing. Um, but you might think of re-looking at a different building saying, okay, we're going to make this an early childhood center slash administrative center, and we're going to redistrict the, cool. the, the entire district so right. we can realign and, yeah. and, and readjust. Um, keep in mind, you just had a task force that said that's probably not a, a good thing to do while you're talking about all these right. things. And so right. you, we don't have the ability right now to just say, okay, mm -hmm. school X, we're moving in and we're going to take over this part. It would require some work if you chose to, that option. I'm sorry to interrupt. It, no, I know. I it is right. From a standpoint of, of, from a rough standpoint of operational piece, but from a standpoint of cultural and, and uh, you know, overall organizational. You're right. It's probably one of the it's probably one of the hardest pieces yeah. out of those options. Um, and so that would be option E in the table. Uh, the option mm -hmm. E in the then, table. And then he may just talk a little bit about upfront costs versus mm -hmm. ongoing. You know what I mean? For like which? For option mm -hmm. E. So you'd have. I mean, obviously, with any property we own. You know, we'll have some operation. We have the mm -hmm. annual operational cost of electric, gas, and so forth. Um, uh, you know, there's. You are moving into. We would be moving into a building that we would still have. I mean, we we'll still have those same issues that we're going to have. Um, our newest buildings are 50 year old. 50, you know, our oldest are, are what they are. Um, so, in some ways, that it doesn't change that mix at all. I mean, we're still going to maintain those anyway. But the, uh, the, the upfront cost would be the yeah. $0.8 million. Correct. Okay. Um, the other piece with the city part and in, in, in working with that joint uh, partnership is that it has a structure where if we're moving into a lease format and paying them back and the city is using our payment to reduce their, their bond levy in the years out. Um, we're not using what limit, and we have a very limited tax base. I mean, there's there's lots of pieces that come into how this operationally works, how the funding and financing works, and how we're trying to minimize any impact to overall operations of schools um, with this piece. It's another reason it wasn't spelled out a little more specifically and put into the master facility plan because you know the initial plan was at to what you know for over the next 20 years a quarter of a billion dollars of work estimated that needs to be done in school buildings where children go to school um, trying to minimize that as much of this as possible so having that joint piece allows us to have some access to funding that we wouldn't normally have. We're not going up against our debt limits and our, you know, and pushing against and then allowing us to have and continually build a capital plan to help address and deal with those other issues in that master facility plan that we know we're not going to get to. Um, so we're not do having, you know, this whole discussion earlier tonight. Right. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, the, the goal is obviously to adjust and do something again, move it in that direction. So, um, you know, and, and again, the overall institutional structure of the community in that there are a lot of spaces that can be jointly used. Um, if you work at, if you look at any large new office building that's built in the last decade or so in the city that, you know, open meeting areas where people sign up and schedule meetings where they're not, you know, right. that's kind of the format and why can't two organizations who are governmental do that same thing and use a third or whatever that number is of less space um, because we do all have an operational cost to build that mm -hmm. and it limits and then it reduces our capital expenses. So, uh, you know, the other option is, the other option for when you don't have lots of money is lease. It's not unlike, you know, if you don't have a down payment for a house, you, you, you're renting. Um, you know, that is a, a possibility as well, and it has a piece to it. Um, and we are a good client because we're a government and we're, you know, we're not going anywhere. Um, we could do a long-term lease 
uh, that build out would be done by the you know the property owner, um, but we would be into that format for a, a longer period of time. Um, so those are the, you know that is another option. The other, uh, I would also add, there's two pieces to the lease and to the purchase part. We are limited within the confines of the district boundaries. Um, we would have to jump when something is available. Um, finding leased space that the district would need and the size that it would want is can be it, it's not there today. It might be there tomorrow and it might have been there yesterday. So likewise with a property to purchase and renovate. Um, it might not be there today. It might be there in six months. We would have to be ready to, to move on a quick on a quick basis to do that, uh, given the market um, for grade B office space uh, and so forth. So, um, so that is that. On an, you know, in a nutshell, on, on the structure of what's available and how it would look like as far as cost. Uh, you want me to talk a little bit about Longfield property or? Well, I, I guess like the one thing I, I wanted to kind of spend some time on is, is going from the numbers because I think if we just look at the numbers, mm -hmm. it doesn't tell the whole story. But if you kind of just spend a few more minutes kind of summarizing, because sure. I think you know the, the leasing option. I think you kind of talked about you know the limitations of within the district. But how did we determine like that annual cost of two hundred ninety four thousand? I actually uh, the the economic development account. Um, yeah, Mike, Mike um, Casa, Casa, Michael Casa. Um, helped me with the lease costs and what current grade B office space is going for in that rate. Um, you know what that would be, and then he also um, we kicked around what the square footage cost might be for a property uh, for for location and, and renovation. Uh, so those two costs came from him. And, and he's seen, you know, the, the numbers that I put together to, to kind of get on, you know, and verified that we were in that range. So that's, you know, because obviously, you know, uh, we don't. And those are not prices that are on Butterfield Road. Those are much higher. So I mean, that's not where we would be moving. We would be moving somewhere, usually probably off of Belmont or something like that, you know, uh, into that type of. I think it's grade B office is the format. Can you help me understand why the lease office space option C is different than the village leasing office space? Why would the market value of leasing from the village be different than leasing from anywhere else? Shared space. We don't have to, we have to lease an entire 14,700 mm -hmm. square feet. Yeah. Where we only need 8,000 square feet with the village because a lot of that space could be shared space. <coughs> so because of the professional development and training that happens on a daily basis that we have ongoing uh, through the school year, uh, we need to have set amount of space available, um, meeting space and so forth. Yep. Um, if okay. we aren't sharing that you know, with the village and, and that, you know, so what we're looking at what the space would be for, the, for us moving in, we're looking at eight-ish in you know eight thousand in, in in our space that we need to put our, our people, and then another additional five six thousand square feet of shared training, professional development, and meeting space that we would share with the village. The village, I mean, the village. The add to the village for us is not just our office. There's going to need to be additional meeting rooms and so forth to accommodate scheduling. Uh, and, and those are some of the detailed pieces we haven't worked out, and we're going to have to work out a little more distinctly as we get if, if we go down that process. Uh, but that's that's the difference. Can that, I ask that does um, are you, what I'm hearing is the assumption that there is not leasable office space. Would that also gives us access to shared spaces? Yeah. Other, otherwise, in the community, is that what you're finding? Um, a lot of the places that have that shared structure. Are not going to be pro er, have a different square footage piece for us, and would not be. I mean, I there is not currently space. If you said go on either renovation, buying something and renovating, 
or leasing today, I could not do that, as I understand it. Now, I haven't checked with Mike today, but it, it, it comes and goes fairly quickly. So on the days that we've talked, those those uh, you know those stuff and, and I go back you know there's there's opportunities that you may end up having to buy you know, rent more than you need because that that's is good. the only there's thing that's perfect there. space that's perfect yeah you're not gonna yeah I mean we need fourteen thousand seven hundred twenty five <coughs> they're gonna have sixteen thousand and, and we're paying on sixteen when it would need to be I mean it can't be up by Yorktown. Right, because that's because we. I mean, we have a by the schools, well, so that it I mean, certainly limits. Conceptually, we need to have a limit. We could be within the. Yeah, we should be in within the. So finding covers. something that's correct near like here is, I think, almost impossible. Well, it's not easy. Uh, and then, Karat, uh, one of the other reasons I, I believe the village is going to, uh, if you're leasing from the village versus leasing from the private sector. Um, Obviously, they're not trying to turn a profit off of the leasing agreement um, like a, a, a private um, citizen would if they were running it to us. The reason that I was asking is that we would have to wait till 2023 yeah. uh, to solve this problem. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a significant amount of time to deal with the challenges with existing Longfellow space, with the split administration. We have a lot of initiatives going on as a district, and to have those be things that we, if we can otherwise erase those sure. problems, uh, having three more years of those problems is still going to be a challenge. Yeah, it, the one thing that I also would, would like to make clear with the board is, is, you know, we wouldn't be in a position, given the way our technology is set up, and, and James can speak to this much better than I can, um, with our model that we have as Longfellow with the center of our technology in the broadband uh, need that we have, um, we wouldn't be able to, at least for a, a, a year, move out of the Longfellow Center because you would have to plan for that transition and we would have to make a determination of, you know, are we going to make that technology hub a different building? Um, you know, should we put it in a different elementary school or something like that? So that would take some time. So. I think no matter what, you would be looking at at least a year, even if we said go for a lease or something like that, just because of um, the technology uh, component of that. Maintenance, I, I think you can move fairly quickly. Um, curriculum materials, you know, you can obviously get a team together and move that very quickly, but the technology piece is something that just wouldn't be able to happen overnight. All of these would also have a build out time. I was gonna say Absolutely. No matter where we lease, perfect. you're going to have a build out yeah. time. You would have to work out something with whoever released to meet our specific needs. Best case scenario, we're probably adding at best or at most a year out than what we would do normally. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Um, so a couple questions about um, BNF. Um, one, the first question is, given that we can't just build a building in a day, uh, let's take a bit of time. <laughs> if we ever went down that road, how would that affect operations? I mean, if we had to... For example, if we chose option F, where we just replaced long is that even feasible? What would we do with with operations that are currently <coughs> going on there? We'd have, have to move out. Yeah, I mean, we we well, no, actually, take that back. No, you would time. build. I mean, you would do exactly what conceptually. You would do exactly what the city is doing. You would stay intact. You would build else on the site, just like you do with a, uh, when you build a replace a school. Mm -hmm. You build on site. Okay. And, and then, then you tear know. down the building. That you've been using after you've moved into the new one. So, so you would build. So if we did it on Longfellow site, we would we would have to build on the back end of that site, mm -hmm. and then move into that, and then take down the existing building. Now, as attractive as it is to me um, to um, not rent, to to have that asset after twenty years that you're paying um, five and a half million dollars for. As opposed to just paying forty four point three million dollars and that's all gone at the end of, at that time, um, not so. But at the same time, though, we ha I have to consider that we would not have the sale of the Longfellow property, which is potentially several million dollars, and we also lose the additional equalized asset, assessed valuation in the, in the community, which would generate sixty thousand dollars plus every year going forward. Um, what else am I missing in terms of like? What's in your mind, Todd? What's the difference between building on this site 
and building on the long fell side of it. Is there anything else that I'm not thinking of? Uh, no, I mean uh, that. I mean that site would be the. I mean, I would think that would be the last upper, the last choice out of all of this, um, in my mind. Just from a dollar sense issue. issue. Just from a dollar. I mean, just from the. Yeah, um, this site is a. Be I mean, if you were to pick between those two options, this site is a better opportunity um, and adjustment. It's also. For, you know, administration centers don't have to be in neighborhoods. It's actually better if you're considering the fact that this is the corporate office of what is a $70 million company of so many workers and employees and, and staff and, and everything else. And you want to make sure people can have ac easy access and you have a main road, um, visitors and everything else. You know, having it on 63rd versus Prairie it makes more sense. Having it on 63rd versus, you know, a side street of a, you know, part of a, former school, you know, makes more sense. Okay. So then, um, in your mind, just asking your, your, your honest opinion, um, given that I mentioned that it's, it would be nice to have that asset after 20 years and not just throwing all that money down the drain on rent, and not down the drain, of course, but you understand what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. um, in your mind, Todd, what's the difference? What are the, what are the, what are the benefits to, to option A as opposed to option F? Like, Option A, um, and of course, obviously, all the you know the detail pieces, you know, as to how that flushes out, is important. But um, option A has the opportunity for us to to limit our capital expenditure, uh, to pay it over a period of time. If we did a thirty-year um, lease agreement, you know. And, and this is an example. It doesn't mean this is a you know the end of the piece, but the next table, you know, kind of put together what it would look like if we were paying that off. Mm -hmm. You know, we would stop payments by 2036, and so you've got that time that you're not making any payments into that. Uh, that you have to either decide to start putting money aside um, for whatever that next is, um, or you have you know. You have revenue and, and, or resources available to do other things with, um, and if it doesn't mean that you know, at some point there's a renewal and a new you know, and, and the city needs to do an update, and the district doesn't go into another format similar to what it did, you know, for the for the per, you know for the building of the property that they're going to do an update. It's going to be five million dollars, and the district's going to pay X portion of that, and it goes in that same format. Um, you know, with a governmental relationship, there is a there is a different structure to that than a lease piece where you do it on an annual piece. Um, as long as the terms work out, and you know, and that structure, you know, is beneficial for both entities. Obviously, at the event, you know, of that piece where if they need that space, then, you know, we have to move and then we're going to have to reallocate and come up with something else. Um, it gets kind of hard to figure out what, what's the need in 30 years of the district and what does it look like. Um, you know, we, we're with fair certainty that we know the Longfellow site is not a school site at this point in time. You know, that site is too small that you would ever do something, um, you know, that doesn't meet current standards and hasn't done so for quite some time. Yeah, you know, the fact that it probably would in the future is not, not likely. So, you know, but what else, what other sites that the district have available to do something at that point in time? I mean, I would say that once you get to, and someone else, you know, at 2035, there's a decision to continue a capital structure that you're putting money aside to build for whatever that next is in the event that you know the district is going to move out of uh, out of that out of that city hall facility if that's the route we went and you could create policy around that to, to right. protect it. I mean, just like we're doing right now, schedule. right? Yeah, just like we're doing right now with the fund policy and yeah. talking about capital and putting stuff aside to to build up um, and to preserve you know, assets to have re those resources for something later on. Yeah, because I know that what, um, when we started 
when I started on the board and David Vine was sitting in your seat, uh, we were having some of the same conversations and there just wasn't a lot of value to the size of that property for us to ever use it in a meaning, uh, meaningful way. Um, and location uh, was a big part of that. But we also then still are going to be maintaining 13, we would still be maintaining 13 um, properties all, all around Donner's Grove. Um, and, it, and at some point, obviously in the near future, some of these buildings are going to have to be you know, in, in decades from now are going to have to be looked at being um, replaced. So obviously you have a lot of different options that you have with, right. you know, on those and grounds. At that point, you, you that. can look at putting it into, you know, what, you know, if you're going to replace on site yeah. one of the buildings because it's, you know, a, there's an opportunity to make that adjustment at that point. Right. For other or even come there. back and use the land that's here or, or whatever. Right. We do have um, a lot of flexibility there. Okay. Yeah. If we were to go, just hypothetically, if we were to go with option A, um, a joint partnership with the village. Um, what would happen to this site? Obviously, Longfellow is different. There's the value in there is very high. This is a little different. What would happen to this? So, this site, there, there's several opportunities that we're looking at right now. And again, that, this kind of gets into the conversation of how how much you want us to pursue. Mm -hmm. So, we've had very very high level talks mm -hmm. with the village mm -hmm. about converting this space in. in this isn't my favorite building in the whole world, but one of the nice things about it is it's basically a concrete square. So you can, it's not tough to knock down these interior walls. So what we have been looking at this for is to make this our new home for curricular storage and to make this our new home for our maintenance department. This is where they would be. There's enough, you know, parking and things like that. And, um, but also to see if the village would be interested because they have a very small maintenance shop. Again, I don't want to confuse this with the fleet that they have. and in, in, in this, uh, We're not talking about putting a salt dome here or anything like that. We're talking about the people who go around their buildings and fix stuff like, like ours uh, do. We have the same machines, the same tools. The, you know, there's an opportunity to you know, put some garage doors on this building and then convert that to... So this would be our new... Longfellow, everything but technology and administrators, if, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. That's the the preliminary discussions that, or, or those are the discussions that we've been having around this site right now. Twenty twenty four. Clarification on the last table on this document: there is a payment stop in twenty thirty six or twenty thirty seven. Does that mean that we would, if in option A, we would be in the city district joint partnership, we would be able to stay into perpetuity in that space without paying for it? That would be one of those things as we, were, we worked through the details and how that would be and what the lease term would be and, and how that would work out would be a piece that we would have conversations and work through with them. Okay. But obviously we would want it, the term to be long enough that it made sense for the investment that the district is yeah. entering into. Okay, it you. would not exceed, I mean, it would well exceed, in my mind, it would well exceed the, the pay structure that we have to pay off, you know, assist in paying off those those bonds that the district, or that the village will have to issue to for building. Instead of paying a traditional lease, we're Correct. front loading it with the significantly right. more. So our term would outlive our payment. Cycle. That's correct. And, and so one of the things that we're really trying to make a partnership with the village work, again, going into it eyes wide open, it has to make sense for our school district. Granted, 58 is not exactly the same blueprint as the village of Downers Grove, but they are close. Mm -hmm. And so the whole point behind having these high-level conversations is the same taxpayers are paying, you know, we may look at the tax bill separately, but at the end of the day, most taxpayers are looking at it and say, okay, what's the total amount, um, how it comes from? And so the, the whole point behind this partnership with the village is, you know, trying to make sure that if we're both looking at the same thing at the same time, how do we do it in a way where we're not double dipping from our taxpayers and really trying to be as respectful of them as, as we possibly can be? So in a setup like this, that's exactly, I think, what, you know, in our very high level conversations with the village right now, it's we're looking for, um, they're looking for a partner that can help offset the total cost of the building and to pay for our portion of it. But then, you know, once that is paid off to, you know, they're not looking for extended payments at that particular point. Uh, that being said, as you get into negotiations and as you start going through all the fine details, um, there are still labor costs and things like that that we would have to consider long term. Um, 
a benefit from sharing with the village. On the other hand, is you know energy costs and things like that. Um, there are definite advantages to partnering with the village because of some of the deals they get for their buildings that we don't get. Uh, electricity would be a great example. So I think what we're looking for today, if I'm not wrong, is just kind of consensus and guidance to say that we would like you guys to continue down the path of trying to find a partnership and trying to define these numbers further if we see value in working with, with the village or does anyone have a major concern that we would want to either stop or get further clarification before continuing down that path? Is I that right? I support the idea. I just don't want to close. I, I, I just think we there's an opportunity to consider um, having our own building. Not not because I think that it's going to be... I, I mean, in 30 years, we're all going to be off the board. A lot of people in this community are going to move out. Um, Kevin's going to be retired and, and taking care of his 49 grand. <laughs> 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 my uncle don't kill me by that. We <laughs> <laughs> don't know what, what the, if the village is going to still want us in that space in 30 years. I mean, I, I know it's a very far way down the road, so it's Nice, but it's still reasonable to think about um, whether whether it's there's still some more thinking to do about whether we should have our own space that we can call our own. Yeah. Like, is there any benefit at this point of us to say, like say we're going to eliminate option blah 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 and say we want you to focus on three or should we or are we not there yet? Do you know I think I mean? we're just saying. Do we want to consider? Do we want to keep moving down the path of, of working with the village, mm -hmm. and to see if that? I think we we want to continue to see those options in those columns because if something pops up, it's something to compare against. Mm -hmm. um, like if, if you came tomorrow and you say, "Oh, this this amazing space that's coming up in <coughs> next year," they're mm -hmm. people are going to renew their lease and it's open. I'm not expecting that, but it could happen. You don't want to close the door on it. Like, but at this point, I think the only one you're actively looking at is the one with the village. Actively, right? There's really right. only two options that we financially can, act, can consider at this point. One is lease, and the other one is the joint partnership with the city. I mean, those are the, those are the two pieces we don't have. I mean, we could sign a bank note or borrow on a bank note um, to, to purchase if that was, but that is moving outside and, and doing some things that, you know, yeah. but that is really at this point financially the only piece we have available to us in the short term to consider. I I am fully supporting some kind of joint opportunity with the village. I think that the people in town will appreciate that we're looking to consolidate and pool our resources together and share spaces. I, I'm, I think you should keep looking into that. That would be my I would love them all to be in the same building. <laughs> I've long wondered why your administration cabinet are not in the same building. It just doesn't make sense at all. And everyone should be in the same building. Great. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I would echo what everybody said. The only thing I would add is I think some of the considerations or the cons of some of the others may be apparent to most people, but I don't think we've spelled them out enough in, in writing. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I would like to see the pros and cons of B through F kind of more explicit. Um, and those, those will probably change over time. But I, I fully support um, um, you know, partnering with the village. And I think those conversations you know, will be fruitful. <coughs> and I'm optimistic and seeing what the, the results of that would be. Yes. My only concern is with the partnership is Parking is that they really need to, that needs to be a big piece of how they're going to make that work well because it's two places that have a decent amount of needs and visitors coming. Um, and da downtown Downers Grove right now, parking is a mm -hmm. pain in the ass. So ju that would be my only, as long as they take that extremely seriously um, for themselves as well as for us. That has, from what I've heard, they are taking. <laughs> that's been a lot of the dialogue. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Even the, and the Good flow job. of that area too. I know. I yeah, I say we can definitely continue conversations with the village to see how that opportunity would play out for us. I think it's definitely something that could be really positive. Um, I would say though that 
like you guys say, don't close the door. I think there's other ones that could potentially be good as well. And I kind of kind of piggybacking on Greg, I think um, the idea of owning our own space, there is a benefit to that, but I can also see that that you know just physically speaking might not be the best. Right. So I'd say continue the conversation. Um, I hate to agree with Steve. <laughs> <laughs> We brought it full circle. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering when it was going to come today. Yeah. Um, I agree uh, we should pursue this option. I think the question for me is on timeline. Mm -hmm. Just like leasing office space in the village comes and goes and can be open one day and can go another, what is the timeline that the village needs an answer to be able to move forward? So I can give you a little bit of a, a window into that, and um, this is where we need to really start getting serious with the talk, should we do it? I think if you are interested in the board in, again, very high-level conversations with the village, they're looking for some kind of a memorandum of understanding from us, and that makes sense, uh, by the spring. So May was the date that they were throwing out there the that spring? they would be looking for us, yes. <laughs> which yeah. seems very far away, but it, it'll be here in like two March days, I'm 22nd? sure. Um, but, but May is um, when they would be looking for a commitment from the board, not financially at this particular point, but in writing that, you know, and, and that makes sense. If they're going to look at this seriously, that they need to know whether or not we are serious as well. And then an intergovernmental agreement by January of 21, because that's when shovels will start going to the ground. Mm -hmm. A question and a comment. Yeah. Um, is 99 at all interested in this? Are we competing with them at all? Or is it no, so that, that's a great question. Obviously, <laughs> I can't speak for, for District 99. Um, District 99 is, is going to have some more challenges. So I don't want to say that they're, they're not serious with this, but... Um, they don't have the facility needs for administrative centers like we do. They also have a much different geographical area for their district. Um, um, granted, we do have a slice of Oak Brook in, in pieces of the other towns, but 99 is a much different yeah. district, and so they have to be very sensitive to, you know, putting their home in the village of Downers Grove Center. Um, I think what the village did was they set this up in a manner that would say we could take on one other school district or two and it would just add another floor to their building. So if 99 is not a serious player in this, um, that won't impact us. Now, if a third partner comes on um, with, the, or excuse me, a second partner on top of the village, um, what that would essentially then rule out is, due to parking, it would rule out the possibility of an apartment building on there or townhomes or something else should the village want to do that. Um, the village has asked us if we would have any objection to that. And Jill, to your point, what I've asked them is parking is, is a, a concern and, and the ability to have people come in and out of that center all day long. Um, so we're not opposed to any plans that would have something else on the site because it would only drive our costs yeah. down as long as we wouldn't have um, any issues with our parking. So I don't want to speak for 99. I think they're in a much different spot for us. I don't think they have the same needs that we do right now, so I don't think the urgency is there. And then my comment is, is I'm just like the idea of sharing space sounds great. I just want to make sure that there's some kind of memorandum of understanding that we are able to give the space when we need it. You know, like mm -hmm. whatever hours we need to plan our PD mm -hmm. and then have our board meetings and X, X Y, and Z. I don't want to have to be in an arrangement where we're constantly fighting for the space that we need. No, and so the design of the building, and again, high level designs um, that we're looking at is each entity would still have their own conference room space during the day. So we would still have a space like this, a, a smaller space, in that the shared boardroom for, for the public and, and for the staff, what we're looking at is, a, is not a dais theater type of design. You're looking at a flat room with the... Multi-purpose. You would be able to split it up 25, partitions. 25, 25 yeah. with partitions or you could have a big room that could host a uh, big board meeting and uh, you know things like that. So I, I do think um, one of the things that we've talked about before we would sign anything is we would get Justin and James uh, together with the village and the police. The police are going to use it more for professional development mm -hmm. and we would take a look at our calendars and how many days we use the Longfellow Center each year, how many days we're using this, how many days they're using their facility to make sure that we wouldn't have those overlapping days. Because you're right, the worst thing we can do is partner together and then for 30 years we you can't have a space. That, that doesn't make any sense for us. All right. Well, I think in general you see some consensus that we're looking to, to go ahead and move forward with uh, continuing to 
to understand the expenses of it more and understanding the impact that we would have in shared space, both parking-wise and um, in the usability of, of the common space. Uh, I, I think that this is a potential opportunity for us to to be really good stewards of the taxpayers' dollars and, and combine uh, a, a resource um, if we can. But we do have to be aware, yes, we are not, we don't only serve Downers Grove, we serve parts of Oak Brook, a little bit of West Mountain Woodridge, I believe, as well. So, um, uh, but yes, please continue to, to move forward on that and keep us in the loop on, uh, on where that goes. And if uh, they want to have any further conversations with us, uh, if Dave Fieldman does or, or the Village Council does as well, we'd be happy to set up a, a joint opportunity to do that. No, I know Jill's probably going to elbow me for continuing this conversation, but um, <laughs> I, I, I know it, like the, the agenda was kind of structured just so we're kind of clear is ASC and Longfellow and then Village. I think we kind of skipped over. We the, just uh, blended them. Yeah, no, but I mean, like, I, I think we should spend time going through, like, the second page of the memo with the assumptions on the, the revenue oh. side of things. Mm -hmm. So, oh, page two. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, you know, in essence, Longfellow is property that we have that you know wouldn't. You know, we we've, we've reviewed, I think, over the you know term and its usefulness, as I've stated, for a, a school site is not you know. Appropriate at this point, and um, it is an asset that the district has um, that has some value to it, and we've <coughs> kind of estimated what that what would be, and if that was to be come onto the market um, and developed as residential, uh, what that would be t as a you know, to understand what that tax impact is, because not only is there a sale price. Of that asset, uh, right. but also um, there is a revenue stream that comes from development. In you know, as a, as a taxing body and under a tax cap, uh, so you know we kind of lay those out. And it, you know, when it's fully built, it, that's the format it went to. It would be you know, around sixty-two thousand dollars a year uh, added in to you know, in, to the operational revenue uh, of the district, which would then be able to be helpful to pay for. Uh, whatever the next step is in, in you know, for that, that operations. Again, continually trying to look at this piece and this aspect of our facility planning as a way not to have any significant impact to uh, school and classroom operations, you know, and, and, and trying to work that through. Um, the sale of property is uh, for a school district is very prescriptive by, by school code. Uh, the board establishes a, a estimated price. We would do that with an assessor, I mean an appraiser, to come up <coughs> with what that value would be, and you do that in closed session. There is a sealed bid structure, um, and you know the the bid the bid that comes in highest that meets that reserve amount is the winning bid. Um, you know, it, it's pretty cut and dry. Um, for obvious reasons. If that price isn't met, then the district is free to market that property uh, with a realtor in this traditional format that you would normally do uh, as anyone else would do. Um, but, you know, we, you know, have, people have lots of ideas and opinions as to how much that property is worth. Uh, obviously, we would engage with our, through our, our legal team and uh, appraiser to come up with that if the just you know board wants to move in that direction and if we get when and if we get to that point however we end up with um, the decision of what our central and administrative offices are going to look like mm -hmm. um, you know that would be the process that we would go through is that yeah no thanks I, mm -hmm. I, I know we've kind of seen this in other forums before, but I, I thought it would be good just kind of make sure that we check that box on the wall. Yep. A couple of things, too, that um, for the public, um, we cannot go into closed session to talk about the sale of a piece of property. So all this has to be done in open session for the public to see. 
However, setting the price, and for obvious reasons, would take place <laughs> in, in, in closed session. Um, same thing if we were to enter on the other end into a leasing agreement. We, we could talk about that leasing agreement, but uh, what I'm trying to assure the public is that these will be open conversations where people will have a chance to provide feedback, to weigh in. A reminder to everyone, all of our meetings are either videotaped if they're at the Village Hall or audio taped here, so everyone will have a chance to listen in and, 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 and get a chance to weigh in on, on any of these things. The other thing, too, is um, with the building itself, if you were to sell that piece of property, keep in mind um, the value of the land would go down because somebody has to take care of the building, abate the asbestos, you know, all those different things. And so that is going to cost a significant amount of money. So, um, you know, people may look at that and go, well, they tore down a home three blocks away and it cost this much and this is how much you can expect. Um, it's not going to be that when it's all said and done because of uh, all the other things should the board choose that avenue. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Doc. You're yeah. welcome. All right, and with all of that, we now come to the public comment portion of the night. This is an opportunity for members of the audience to share in public comment with the board but is not intended for a time for members of the public to enter into a dialogue with the board. Issues raised during public comment may be added to, a future, to future agendas or addressed by administrative staff as appropriate. Criticism of individuals is not in order. The board has allotted 30 minutes for public comment this evening. We ask that you keep your comments to three minute limit to allow everyone the opportunity to speak. Um, I, did anyone provide us with any cards this evening? No cards. Oh, we do not have any out at all. No, out. Oh, okay. There's just no cards yeah, in the box. No cards all right. The so then, no. um, <laughs> so then, if, since there are no cards, if anyone is interested in speaking, uh, uh, please stand up and state your name and attendance area, and provide your public comment. If you did not fill out a card before coming to speak, please take a card and turn it in afterwards so that we may follow up with you. Hi, my name is Joe Leo. I'm a uh, resident of Pierce Downer. Over at Montgomery, right two doors down from Longfellow. Mm -hmm. So you can probably guess why. We have a little concern over the discussion. And this, and full disclosure, I was, I sat right where you mm -hmm. sat. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> About 15 years ago with my fellow board member Marshall. And, um, only one comment about, I diverged a little later, about, there was a comment about earlier boards not paying attention about or worrying about <laughs> facility needs. <laughs> You're wrong. Yeah. We, we, that was so big on our, our agenda constantly. So anyway, um, when you think about Longfellow and the sale of Longfellow, your projections show a three-year build-up of those homes. Think about that. You are going to put an entire neighborhood in a construction zone three years. Three years. I mean, we've, had, we've had teardowns in our neighborhood. I can tell you, it's the, the people that move in are lovely, but the process to build a new home, one new home, is a nightmare. So you're talking about 12 new homes. And they're all going to sell right away. You were going to sit and right. Anyway, think of other options. One would be a wonderful discussion about intergovernmental uh, work with the village. About the park district, maybe arrange with them in a deal with them where I mean uh, I know you lose mm -hmm. the revenue stream, but at the end of the day, sixty sixty thousand dollars for a seventy million dollar company is not not that big. A deal with them where they would buy the land from you, but you would have an option every five, ten, fifteen, twenty, thirty, fifty, hundred, two hundred, three hundred years to buy that land back. We talked about the future of education and what it might hold. We we're talking 20, 30 years. Long time. We'll, mm -hmm. Some of us may not be walking the earth then. Think 200 years, 300 years. We're selling. We sold Washington. We sold Lincoln Center. We're selling. The Park District is buying. They're planning for the future. Once we get rid of Longfellow, chances are we never can get it back. We don't know what the future of education holds, what it will look like way off in the future. If we get rid of that land, sell the developers, it's gone. Never be gotten back. A deal with the park district, maybe the village, 
there's stormwater concerns. Maybe Longfellow could be used with the park district and the village to address some of those concerns. I guess what I'm trying to say is don't just jump at developer money. Think about other things because you know there's potentially 12 houses, but there's no way you can put 12 houses on that amount of land without some sort of stormwater feature. So you're probably going to lose two lots to that. So anyway, yeah, bottom line, think of other options. Think about the entire area. And if you do have an opportunity, go over to Longfellow, stand behind the building, and look south. Everything goes south. Yeah. You will be pushing an enormous amount of water down the street into the neighbor's basements, backyards, and all that kind of stuff. So anyway, I just wanted to share that. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so Thank much. You. Chris Hanley, uh, son at uh, Herrick. Um, I think you're in for a hell of a fight over the next six months. Um, that being said, um, I would tend to disagree with Paul, not the relation Hanley, um, that um, <laughs> putting out as a marketer Putting out a good, better, best is always an option. Because um, people will try and go for the better as opposed to the higher end or lower end. Um, I am encouraged by the considerations of the South uh, of Longfellow um, as a way to help sell the, the school building plan. I think it's very fiscally and taxpayer responsible. And I'm in love with the idea of going to partnership with the village because that further shows fiscal responsibility. Um, I think these things all need to be taken into consideration at the same time. Um, and I think you have an opportunity to take some, some spin on selling larger school plan by some of the opportunities that are presented by what's going on with the village and with the chance to uh, sell on public. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. <coughs> Marshall Schmidt, uh, Pierce Downer, um, attendance area, and I live uh, just across the uh, Seeley side of uh, Longfellow, and I, I did sit, sit at that table for, uh, for eight years. The concern I have is that you talked about a master plan in the first part of this meeting, and then Superintendent Russell described it as a parallel path. You don't have a master plan. What you have is a plan for your school facilities, and then you are thinking about what to do and what all the options are with your administrative facilities. And with regard to the second piece of it, you haven't put in the time and the energy and community engagement with regard to that second piece. And even though I am obviously interested because of where I live, that whole neighborhood, if they get wind of the fact that you're looking to sell a lot fell and you're trading it off against a school plant, you just lost that whole neighborhood. They're going to vote against the referendum. It's, it's going to be a mess. Okay? And, and I'll add with regard to the referendum, I think you're being terribly unrealistic. Joe and I went through a referendum plan. I think the community is getting better at appreciating education as it should. I mean, the, the, the District 99 plan passed. But I think you need to look more at why the District 99 plan passed. It's because there was a story there that you didn't need to tell because Superintendent Russell is right. You are not going to be able to advocate for this plan. As soon as it goes on the ballot, you are restricted by law. There are some things you can do, but you cannot advocate for it. And unless it is apparent from what you're doing, immediately apparent to the people who are voting on this referendum, you don't have a ghost of a chance. And 
you don't understand how conservative this community is. We went through our referendum plan and passed a referendum in 40 years. Either district, okay, the fact that District 99 passed, I think, is cause for hope. But again, I think the reason it passed is because it was security, security, security. Okay, with all the shootings in these schools, that resonates with me. But Member Harris is correct that a very large percentage of the people in this community, okay, they're, they're a little spoiled, right? The schools here are great, okay? The schools are frequently cited as one of the main reasons why people move here, okay? People do not perceive the schools as failing here. They perceive them as successful. And it's part because you guys all work together, and I was very impressed with how well you work together and how high-functioning this board is, and that is, that is encouraging. But you need to take into account what you're going to do with the Administrative Service Center, because if you don't, you're going to get hammered, and people are going to come out of the woodwork, okay? And, and let me just give you one other tip. Air conditioning, no chance. No chance. The number of days that the schools actually use air conditioning is very low, okay? And although, yeah, it would be a nice thing to have for the kids, would it improve educational value? Of course it would. All of these things you have on here would improve educational value. All those things are valuable. We should pass all those things. We should pay our teachers more money. But what the residents of this village are going to ask is what do you need? It's like the scene from It's a Wonderful Life. When the woman comes to George Bailey and says, I want all my money. And he says, how much do you really need? And she says, $2.20. Okay? That's the way the people in this village think. And unless you think like that, you're not going to ever pass a referendum. I like that you're taking a poll. That's really good. We didn't have that luxury. But you need to really appreciate just how conservative this, um, this community is. Because people will come out. They'll attack you personally. They'll attack the thought of this. And if you don't have this administrative service piece like handled, it's going to be a problem. I think going to talk to the village, of course you've got to talk to the village. It's an opportunity. You'd be irresponsible if you didn't. But you've got to take into account all of the expenses and the opportunity cost of having to move all of your, all of your resources over there. And, and the loss of control over that facility is huge. It's really huge. You get into that building and, you know, they need more conference room space. They need more professional development space. You're not high on their priority list. And no matter what provisions you write into the lease, they're going to say, it's our building. And we get to do with it what we want. And that's a problem for you because you can't then satisfy your needs. And people are going to ask those questions. You know, you've got these two buildings. Yes, it's not optimal. But you have those two buildings in hand. I didn't see on here, and maybe it's somewhere in the numbers, how much it would cost to bring Longfellow up to code. And yeah, you have to live with two buildings. Okay, but you've lived with two buildings for a very long time. And again, the residents of this village are going to ask, why do they need a big new space and a big new village hall, which is going to be controversial in its own right. right? The village is going to get a lot of pushback when they build a big new facility. Now we've tied this school district's fortunes to that controversy. Why do that? Why do that? And maybe it, it makes sense, but you have to have an answer to that question because people are going to ask those questions during the referendum. They're going to ask all kinds of questions about what you're doing with your other property. And if you say, well, we're sort of talking in the village, we may do this, we may do that. You're, you're asking for $100 million and you don't know what you're going to do with, with your asset over here? It's going to be a problem for you. So you've got to look at it as a master, master facility plan. One last suggestion. I don't understand why you're looking at doing the referendum for a member. This is going to be one of the highest
highest turnouts of uh, any election in a very long time. Okay? Very, you know, very energetic election, right? With what's at stake. The people who come out in the for the municipal elections in the spring, they're the ones you want because they're the really motivated voters. They're the ones who are looking at what's on the rep- what's on the uh, the ballot and what do we do. And if you have a referendum there, you have your chances of passing the referendum are much higher. You're going to get everyone coming out of the woodwork in November, and a lot of people who are not favorably disposed towards education. The people you're going to get in the spring are going to be much much better voters for you. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. That's okay. Thank you. Hi, I'm John. My name is Don Runner, uh, 1304 Maple Avenue. Um, I have a daughter, Herrick, and two in Hillcrest. I'm just doing that. So I came tonight because um, I was a former board member of District 99, sitting on the board three years ago, having similar discussions to what we're having tonight. So I thought I'd just share my perspective. Um, been loosely following your progression of the referendum question. I've had some discussions with Tracy, but um, um, just been following along um, tangentially. Um, we got to a point about three years ago where you were at tonight, where we were sitting across the table trying to prioritize projects, doing what Tracy did coming up to the board and saying, I want to take this off and do that. Um, I, what I would say is you got to put your pencils down. And you've got to contact the community first and get a sense as to what they're going to support as a dollar figure. I'm really confused tonight by trying to put together an A, B, and C plan with all levels of details in there. When someone picks up the phone and is going to run polling for you, they're not going to have an opportunity to say, option A has this, 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 and this. And oh, by the way, you've never had any discussion about any of these projects. So um, to have, to, to, to try and poll your community with such a detailed level of itemization on A, B, and C over the phone, I think I think it's going to be difficult. Paul Paul is fantastic. He was amazing for our for our plan. Um, you know, I, I would trust and live by what he tells you to do. Um, I would have liked to have an opportunity to, to pose that as to that question as to why he's doing it. I know it's not a Q and A session tonight. But I'd like to know why he's proposing that. Um, you know, a couple other things. Um, the poll is not the ask. So I heard a lot tonight about, oh, you know, if we ask for the, if we go out and poll on the 226 number, pitchforks going to come out. Polling is not the ask. Um, uh, Mr. Harris, you said tonight that every single thing on the original plan, you totally support. In fact, you said you, you would convert your paycheck and pay for it yourself. That means it's a need. If it's true need, then why are you why are you selling yourself short and not polling your community about all of your needs if it's truly a need? And to follow up that question, um, tonight you decided on um, putting 179, 139, and 99. Um, what if the community comes back and says, "We love the 179"? Have you sold yourself short? What happens? What happens if, if you get 60% that says 179? Well, are you going to go back and poll and say, well, we used 226? <laughs> don't, sell, don't sell yourself short. We had board members, just like board members here, who said, you know what, $136 million is too much. I will never support that. I can't imagine going out and asking those questions. We got over that hump, and guess what? They said, uh, just as Paul said, it was literally about 64% said 136, 64% would support 98. So we went with 136 on the ballot question. So don't sell yourself short. Um, uh, the last thing I would say is um, you you had a discussion and it was lively and it was really good. Um, and then you moved and you made your decision without having public comment before you made your decision. I think that was a mistake tonight. Um, um, I think you have, I think going forward in the future, before you make any decisions going forward on this referendum question, you need to have public comment. 
before you make a decision. Because you could potentially, you know, um, make those who come here and want to express their opinions feel like their decision and their voice is not um, But I, I wish you the best of luck. You guys have a much more difficult job than we did. Um, bonds were falling off. The, the tax dollars and the impact was a totally different story. Um, I agree with a lot of what you said, but um, you're still making a lot of assumptions. And that's what the, the strength of the polling is. And trust the polling. The polling was absolutely fantastic. It was spot on. So good luck. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Any other public comment tonight? Okay. Then we have a couple of announcements. A uh, couple of dates. Uh, Friday, March 6th at 7 a.m. That's tomorrow morning. Right here will be the Financial Advisory Committee meeting. I expect, I expect everybody to be there. I'll buy the coffee. All right. Now you know. Uh, and then um, mon Monday, March 9th at 7 p.m. will be our regular board meeting. Uh, at Village Hall. And there's not a, there's no pre anything. There's no pre anything. We're just seven o'clock. Just a regular board. You can come if you want, Angel. <laughs> See you at five. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right. And with that, I is there a motion to adjourn? So so second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Motion carried. The meeting is now adjourned at 9 10 p.m.